Hello and welcome to another book synopsis with Unjustified. My name is Kim and I will be your host. To clarify a few things before we get started, I do not read the books word for word. I do change the words to my own. However, if it is direct quotes or direct legal wording and verbiage, those things I will not change. Even after you finish listening to my synopsis of this book, I highly recommend and encourage you to go purchase the book itself. In no way is my synopsis going to ever hold justice to the actual author's words. I will always leave a link in the description box below where you can purchase the book. Also, my book synopsises are not documentaries. They are not videos nor photos. These are basically like a podcast or an audible. So without further ado, let's get in to this book. For the foreword of this book, Indefensible, I find no better way for the author's foreword to be given to you other than through his own words. His foreword is absolutely available on his Amazon page where this book is available to purchase. However, I will go ahead and play it here with my synopsis and please check out the link below. Read the entire book. There is so much to learn in this book about the justice system and how things work in the justice system. So without further ado, a word from the author. Forward. Indefensible recounts a three-month journey I embarked upon after I watched the Netflix documentary Making a Murderer, along with tens of millions of other viewers around the globe, in late December 2015. The trip was strange because I thought I'd already taken it. Twice. Once, when I watched Stephen Avery's murder trial unfold in the county where I work as a prosecutor, and again three years later when I reviewed its high points for the final section of a book I was writing about the Avery case entitled The Innocent Killer. That book, published by the American Bar Association in 2014, focused on Avery's wrongful conviction in 1985, not his 2007 trial. In neither of those trips did I pay close attention to the landscape of the murder trial. It wasn't my trial, after all. I was not directly involved. To my surprise, I began to wonder while watching the series whether I had taken a wrong turn ten years earlier and reached the wrong conclusion when, like everyone else in my line of work, I had assumed the evidence-planting defense in the Avery trial was nonsense. Avery's accomplice, Brendan Dassey, had confessed and identified his uncle as the main culprit and there was overwhelming physical evidence linking Avery to the scene of the crime. It was, as some prosecutors like to say, a slam-dunk case for the state. At least, that's what I thought at the time. Was it possible we might all have been wrong? I knew the documentary's producers were biased in favor of Avery. They had interviewed me for the project, and they even tried to get me to come around to their way of thinking. But some of the material in the docu-series was new to me, and none of it was complimentary to the police with regard to how the evidence was found and the interrogation methods used on Brendan Dassey, Avery's 16-year-old learning disabled nephew and accomplice in Teresa Hallback's murder. So I decided to journey through the trial again, but this time more carefully, as if my life depended on it. Because it might. Half the country, it seemed, was convinced the police had set up Avery again, that lightning had struck twice, and that he had been wrongly convicted a second time. Many people were angry. Some made threats on my life and the lives of others because we were part of Manitoba County law enforcement and had spoken out publicly of Avery's guilt in the wake of making a murderer. Indefensible recounts my independent search for the truth about the Stephen Avery case. I thought I knew that truth, but it was to some extent fractured by making a murderer. As I delved deeper into the circumstances surrounding Teresa Hallback's murder, the truth became whole again. 
As in any issue as complicated and as controversial as this one, the truth is elusive in the Avery case. Peruse the Reddit pages on the topic of Stephen Avery for an hour, and you will see what I mean. I tried to be as careful and unbiased as possible when I conducted my research for this book, but in the end, perfect objectivity is only something we can strive for. I'm still a prosecutor in Manitowoc County, Wisconsin. This is the background I come from. I'm not pro-prosecution in the usual sense. I have believed for a long time that the criminal justice system is broken to some degree and needs to be reformed. I have given presentations about wrongful convictions and police and prosecutor misconduct. I have written about these issues as well and about what can go wrong if prosecutors lose sight of their calling and seek convictions instead of justice. I share with the creators of Making a Murderer a desire to draw attention to broken aspects of the criminal justice system so that it can be reformed where needed. I also serve on the advisory board at the Wisconsin Innocence Project, a role that should not be, but is, a rarity among prosecutors. That's not to say my judgment is free from any and all bias. No one's is. So take what you read as you will and decide for yourself. There are a few things you should know at the outset. First, although I am still a prosecutor in Manitoba County, I wrote this book in my personal capacity as a private citizen who has made his home in a Wisconsin community that has been bedeviled by the Avery case for 30 years. I played a role in Mr. Avery's exoneration in 2003, but I was not involved in his wrongful conviction in 1985, nor in his murder trial in 2007. Mr. Avery's 36 million... Chapter 1. In on it too. This chapter starts out with the author talking about how he was so shocked while he was looking over Stephen Avery's files in the Teresa Halbach murder. Because almost the minute after the very first airing of Making a Murder, the problem started from social media all the way to getting bomb threats. The author had a prior book called The Innocent Killer. He had actually published this book two years before Making a Murder ever aired. Up until the point of the documentary, he was a four and five star. The comments on his book on Amazon were very positive, but almost as soon as this documentary aired, the negative reviews and stars started coming. His book, titled The Innocent Killer, is all about Avery being wrongfully convicted in 1985 and being framed for the crimes against Penny Bernstein. The book was all about how the broken system of police and prosecutors seek to get convictions instead of justice, and how they had gotten it very, very wrong in Stephen Avery's case. He had lost 12 years of his life in prison for a crime that he never committed. Now, I know a lot of you are thinking, no, he, he did 18 years. Well, he did. He actually did serve 18 years. However, six of those years were served from a different conviction that he had pled guilty to, and he was found guilty. And that was for the case of his neighbor and cousin, Sandra Morris, and that is explained a little further into the book here. Now, before the Making the Murder documentary aired, the author says that the vast majority of people in Wisconsin, as well as anyone that really knew about the case, never questioned that Stephen Avery may be innocent. You see, the author was still employed as an assistant DA in Manitowoc County when the murder of Teresa Halbach happened. He was not directly involved in the prosecution, however. The only thing that he'd done involving Teresa Halbach's case, or the trial, was that he had drafted the initial search warrant. After the trial was over and Avery was found guilty by the jury, the author said that he had zero doubt that the jury got it wrong because he was watching the actual trail of evidence of the trial and he says that the guilt pointed straight to Avery without any doubt in his mind and the only ones that thought any different at all were the few people that actually bought the defense's very far-fetched theory that the evidence was planted by law enforcement. The author says his personal opinion is that the trial judge, the prosecutors, and Stephen's very prominent and seasoned attorney team gave him a very fair and balanced trial. 
It took the jury three days of deliberation to decide that the evidence presented to them led them to agree that Avery was guilty as he was charged. After people watched Making a Murderer, they came out in droves, even making two petitions, one to President Obama and the other to Governor Scott Walker, with over half a million signatures. These petitions were begging for Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey to be released. These people were convinced that Avery had been framed again and they had used Brandon as like a pawn to get them both convicted. But see, the thing is, none of the law enforcement that were involved in the Hallbach murder were even employed there 30 years prior when the real wrongful conviction of Avery happened. It was almost like the Making a Murder documentary had almost brainwashed an entire nation to a point that the author says, him as well as law enforcement, were receiving death threats almost on a daily basis. Serious death threats. So what was it about this one documentary that made hundreds of thousands of people be convinced beyond any doubts in their mind that Avery was being framed again by the same county that framed him the first time? So the author said he decided to sit down, watch the documentary, compare the actual trial evidence and transcripts with what the documentary was showing and see what was going on. And that was his point for this book. He wanted to bring out the actual facts to the people that Making a Murder left out or cut and spliced and manipulated. That's when he first started watching the documentary that he was totally consumed with it. It was put together so professionally and the haunting background music made it that much more intriguing. Then Cousin Kim comes in saying that Stephen was always a happy guy, always tried to make people laugh to be their friend, and he did some stupid stuff when he was young, but he has always owned up to everything that he'd done wrong. She went on to say that she thinks that because he was an Avery, they all viewed him as a troublemaker. Stephen then went into his testimony on camera about being 22 years old, saying, quote, Another mistake I did, I had a bunch of friends over, and we were fooling around with the cat, and they were kind of acting it on. I tossed the cat over the fire, and it just lit up. It was our family cat, but I was young and dumb and hanging around the wrong people, end quote. Now, that was obviously a deflection on blaming himself and instead deflecting the blame for what he'd done to the cat onto his friends being the wrong people. Also calling himself young and dumb, when in fact, when this incident happened, Stephen was 20 years old. He was not a kid, as he talked like he was when this happened. This definitely was not a childish prank. Making a murderer was trying to make it seem like that, but it absolutely wasn't. The police report actually stated that Stephen had taken the cat and drenched it in gasoline and oil while it was alive. He, the police report actually stated that Stephen had taken the cat and drenched it in gasoline and oil while it was still alive. And then he tossed it into the bonfire. Of the people that was actually there and was an eyewitness said at one point that the cat did manage to break away and get it out of the fire. And Stephen chased it down, caught it, poured more gasoline on it, threw it back in the fire, and watched it die. He tortured this cat, and he watched it die a horrific and miserable death. These are two of the most common traits of future murderers, animal cruelty and playing with fire. And both of those were sadistically twisted into one horrific act by Stephen. Then in the documentary, it goes on to where he assumes that Stephen was supposed to be garnering sympathy about how he sadistically killed this cat. He was saying, quote, I even missed the birth of my daughter because I was locked up for the cat incident, and it kind of sucked, you know? You're supposed to be bringing your kid into the world, and you gotta miss it. End quote. Having these two scenes back to back was very disturbing when you knew the truth about the cat. It seemed to be painting a picture of a harmless accidental act by a bunch of kids instead of what it really was. 
which was a very sadistic act of animal cruelty and torture by a 20-year-old man just to get a laugh out of others. And I sure did not find it one bit amusing at all. He says by this point in the documentary that he was wondering if the viewers watching this was at all familiar with the actual events and facts and evidence of his past convictions or if they were just being led through the scenes with one bad act being covered by sympathy and crying for forgiveness. The author says that he was anxious to see how the producers of Making a Murderer would bring into the documentary Stephen's more serious crimes even after the cat case. This would be the crime against his neighbor, Sandra Morris, because the author says that he was very well aware of the actual facts and the evidence of that case, as well as he had fully read all of the police reports in that case. And after watching how they also glossed over that case and even edited and manipulated the actual testimony of Sandra Morris, he says he could totally see why the public were thinking that the county just thought Stephen was basically just a menace to society. Now, the author did go into explicit detail in the book about this particular case, and after reading and fact-checking his claims in the book about this case with the actual transcripts myself, I agree with the author that Stephen's actions in this case were much more extreme than the documentary portrayed them to be. I will just gloss over some of the details myself of the actual case here for my synopsis. This crime took place about six or seven months before Stephen's 1985 arrest on Penny Bernstein. In early January of 1985, at 5.30 a.m., Stephen Avery rammed his car into the side of his neighbor Sandra Morris's car as she drove by Stephen's house on her way to work. Sandra stopped her car and got out. Stephen was pointing a weapon at her head walking towards her, attempting to hold her at gunpoint and demanding that she got into his car. This was a very cold morning and Sandra just happened to have her infant daughter in the car with her on this morning. She was bringing her to the babysitter on her way to work. She pointed to the baby in the car and she told Stephen that she couldn't get in his car and leave the baby alone in her car or the baby would freeze to death. Stephen looked inside her car and seen that the baby was indeed in there and he told her just to go on then. Sandra called the police and within an hour Stephen was arrested. And while searching Stephen's house for the weapon, they found a 30 6 shotgun hidden under one of his kids' beds, and it had a live round inside the chamber. Stephen confessed to running Sandra off the road and crashing his car into hers. He also confessed to holding her at gunpoint and trying to force her to get into his car. He did plead guilty to doing all of this, but of course, he also had a reason why he done this, and that was because Sandra had been spreading lies about him while she was out drinking at all the bars. At this time, Stephen was married to and living with his wife, Lori. This is the mother of his twin sons. This was not the only time that Sandra had had problems with Stephen. Sandra was also the wife of a Manitowoc County deputy, and Stephen knew this very well because he was also related to Sandra Morris. She was his cousin. But Stephen did not care about that whatsoever. But even with all of these facts easily being obtained through public records, the documentary seemed to be portraying Sandra as the villain and Stephen as the victim. And the author of this book said that he was absolutely taken back seeing how that serious of a crime was painted to the viewers, and the parts in the documentary of Sandra's deposition was unscripted, and it was edited to make it look like Stephen was just fed up with Sandra spreading lies about him all over town. It is very rare when the victim is being blamed, when they're having to relive 
a past crime done to them, and that is the very impression that the author said he took away from that crime and the way it was presented to the viewers of the documentary. Stephen had harassed Sandra on way more than one occasion, and it all started a few months before this. Stephen knew what time Sandra left for work every morning, so he would get up early and put on his binoculars field glasses and watch up the road waiting to see Sandra leave her house. He would do things like just stand there rubbing his private parts. He would be on the hood of the car sometimes as she drove by, and sometimes he would be on the hood of the car masturbating while she drove by. He would sometimes just be standing there exposing himself to her and wearing nothing except his shoes. Stephen was charged with two accounts of endangering safety by contact regardless of life as a repeater one account for Sandra, and one account for the infant. He was also charged for a felon in possession of a firearm. So all of that combined in Stephen's prior convictions made him an habitual offender. This increased the maximum sentence on each account by six years. Stephen was facing a sentence of 48 years in prison at this point. His bail was set at only $2,000 and his parents posted that right away for him. While he was out on bail, this is when the crime against Penny Bernstein happened, and he was eventually arrested wrongfully on this crime as well. Stephen was ultimately sentenced to six years for the crimes against Sandra Morris, 32 years for the Penny Bernstein case, and they were to run concurrently. So... Six of those 18 years that he spent in prison before he was exonerated for the wrongful conviction was for his crimes against Sandra Morris. So in actuality, he only spent 12 years of the 32 that he was sentenced that he was actually wrongfully convicted of. Media and the documentary led viewers to think that the entire 18 years that he was incarcerated before being exonerated was all years that he should have been a free man. But that is not the actual facts. The author says that he could tell where the documentary was going by the end of the very first episode, especially the way it ended with his cousin saying, quote, they were just going to let Stevie out. They were not going to hand that man $36 million. My gut told me they were not done with Stephen yet, and something was going to happen, end quote. Then, to really add a finale to the ending of the first episode, the dispatch radio can be heard saying, quote, Do we have a body or anything yet? And the female dispatch replies by saying, I don't believe so. The officer's reply was, Do we have Stephen Avery in custody yet, though? Chapter 3 Hijacked. The author says that after the airing of Making a Murder, the courthouse was buzzing with conversations being heard about the documentary and from what little that he listened to and that he was overhearing, it appeared to him like the documentary had struck a nerve for almost everyone. Almost four months after Avery's arrest in the Hallbach murder, Special Prosecutor Ken Kratz gave a very damning press conference and pretty much destroyed the defense's argument that evidence had been planted by the county to frame Avery. This very detailed conference came only hours after Brendan Dassey had confessed earlier that day to detectives during questioning. This press conference was the most shocking and gruesome information that had came out about the case since Teresa's vehicle and her charred remains had been found on the Avery property. Kratz held nothing back in this conference. There was even a viewer discretion warning given before the conference that was shown on live TV. And no one under the age of 15 should be present to hear or hear the details of this conference. Just to say that the details of this press conference were horrific would be an understatement. Police had suspected that Dassey knew way more 
than what he was telling up until this point when he finally opened up about what really happened. Kratz even went into detail about what Brendan actually said during his complete and uncut and unedited confession. The author has written the details fully in the book, but I will go over them only in part. Brendan had gotten off of the bus that afternoon, and after checking his mailbox and seeing that there was a letter in there with Stephen's name on it, Brendan decided to take this piece of mail to his uncle's trailer before he goes on to his house. As he got closer to Stephen's house, he said he heard a woman's voice and she was screaming, help me. Stephen opened the door and he was drenched in sweat and he told Brendan to come in and ask him if he wanted to, quote, get him some of that. End quote. Brendan walked to the bedroom and saw that Teresa was bound by handcuffs and leg cuffs to the bed. She was naked and crying. Stephen told Brendan that he had already raped her and was going to keep doing it for a while and kept on at Brendan to join in with him. Brendan said that Teresa was crying and begging him not to join in and not to do that to her and to please, please make his uncle stop. But Brendan said he decided to take Stephen up on the offer, and so he got on top of her and he arred her also. He arred her for about five minutes while Stephen stood at the side of the bed just watching him. Brendan said then him and Stephen went into Stephen's living room and they watched TV for maybe 10 or 15 minutes while Stephen continued to praise Brendan, telling him, quote, that's how you do it. End quote. Stephen continued to tell Brendan that he was real proud of him, and then Stephen started talking about killing Teresa when they were done with her and burning her body. Brendan said that Stephen went into the kitchen and he came back with a knife, and they both went into the bedroom where Teresa was. He said that Stephen told Teresa that he was going to kill her now. Brendan said that Stephen stabbed Teresa in the stomach, and then handed him the knife, and told him to cut her throat. After Brendan cut her throat, Stephen told him to cut off her hair, and then Stephen strangled her. Brendan said that him and Stephen then took off her handcuffs and ankle cuffs, and tied her with the rope, and took her out to the garage. Brendan said he thought that she was already dead by the time they took her out to the garage, but Stephen went ahead and shot her about 10 times with the rifle when they got her into the garage. Brendan said after Stephen shot her, they both picked her body up and threw her on the fire pit that was already burning when Brendan got home from school that day. The pit was not even 20 yards outside Stephen's bedroom window, and it was behind his garage. Brendan said they both put some old tires and brush on top of her body to get the fire started up really good. And while her body was burning, they drove Teresa's RAV4 to the edge of the property and they hid it with some limbs and brush. Brendan also said that Stephen told him that a few days after they had burned Teresa's body, that he had went back out to the fire pit and he broke up her bones with a shovel and buried those two or three feet from where the fire pit was and more so towards the garage bed that Stephen used a bucket and put some of her bones in it and put some of them by a steep hill at the neighboring quarry pit. Kratz ended these shocking details by saying that Brendan did admit that he should have tried to stop Stephen, but that Stephen had threatened him and said he would stab him if he told anyone. When a detective asked Brendan why he decided to participate in the aring of Teresa. Brendan replied by saying, quote, I wanted to see how it felt, sex, end quote. The author says that after hearing that press conference, the only thing he could think about was Teresa's family. The last thing they had known was her remains had been found charred and burned. So they knew that she had met a horrific ending in her last hours of life, but after hearing the details of those last hours and the torture that she endured, it left him feeling deep pain for her family having to hear 
these horrific details of the end of her life. He said he wondered if her family had just heard what he did in the press conference for the first time, or had Kratz done what he should have morally and ethically done before telling it to the whole nation through media and live TV, and that is to have contacted her family first before telling it to the entire nation. The state argued at trial that Stephen had lured Teresa onto his property Halloween of 2005, and the author says that he does believe that this is true because Stephen called Teresa's employer, Auto Trader Magazine, and actually requested that it be Teresa who come out and photo the vehicle that he had for sale. He told her employer to send, quote, that photographer who had been out here before, end quote. Then Stephen called Teresa's personal phone three times after he talked to her employer. He also used the Star 67 feature on two of those calls as to hide his identity and his name and number on her phone so it would show up as a unknown caller. So it was very evident that Teresa did know exactly where she was going that evening and who she was going to be meeting with when she got to the salvage yard that day. Teresa did give Stephen a return call and left him a message telling him that yes, she could come and photograph the vehicle for him that day, but it would be later that afternoon, around two or maybe even later. She did ask that he call her back to confirm that time frame and make sure it would be okay for him. The author says that the return call from Teresa confirmed to him that Teresa was not afraid of Stephen because the tone of her voice did not seem like she was stressed or worried about meeting up with him at all. Stephen had hired a dream team of attorneys for this murder case. And oddly enough, these attorneys were using the same evidence the prosecution was using to show guilt. The defense was using that same evidence to prove innocence. It was things like the key and the bullet and the blood in the RAV4. When the state would present these items as evidence of guilt, the defense would come back with reasons why these items proved innocence, saying it was all a frame-up and the cops were doing their dirty deeds again, claiming that it was very obvious that all of these things were planted evidence and they were only trying to wrongfully convict Stephen Avery again. Even though by the time the documentary was aired on this case, Brendan and Stephen had both been found guilty and the Court of Appeals had already affirmed both of their convictions nearly a decade earlier. So how could a documentary make a difference in a case by the narrative pointing towards the suggestion that they may be innocent? The author says that he does admit that several things in the documentary even made him rethink his own opinions on the case, making him scratch his head and wonder if he did indeed really know the truth about the case. He says he was starting to question their guilt himself, and at one point, he was not entirely sure himself anymore if they were truly guilty. And also the clips that the documentary showed of the trial of the officers testifying, it did make it appear that they were very defensive and shouldn't have been that way if they had nothing to hide, correct? But after he decided to watch the entire depositions of their testimonies, his thoughts changed a lot on them seeming like they were trying to hide something by being so defensive. But there was also a small part of him that felt like possibly they were. The author goes on to talk about his time on the stand and when he was defending Stephen Avery in the wrongful conviction charge. He testified to several things he personally felt was wrongdoings, and then he told about some of the facts in the case that had obviously been overlooked and not presented to the jury in the trial. He told about the phone calls that he had had with the DA who had prosecuted the case himself. After the results had came back proving that Allen had committed the crimes against Penny 
and it was not Stephen Avery at all. And then there was also how the DA had actually signed the complaint charging Gregory Allen, but that complaint was found in Stephen Avery's file. The author goes on to say that he no longer even wanted to be a prosecutor again, not after seeing firsthand how the DA and a few others in the department had framed Stephen Avery. He even thought about leaving his job as a prosecutor altogether, but knew that he had to continue to provide for his family. On the morning they presented the stipulation and order granting Stephen's release, the judge asked him to call the DA and give him a heads up about it all before the media started hounding him. So he called him. There was not really much said, because even though he had met the former DA in the past, they were not really close buddies, you know. So he just kept it pretty much straightforward and to the point, telling him that the crime lab had retested the DNA and the results made it very clear that Stephen Avery was innocent and Gregory Allen was Penny Bernstein's assailant. The author said, that the former prosecuting DA did not even try to act like he was shocked at all. He didn't even seem like it bothered him in the least bit that he had sent an innocent man to prison for a crime that he did not even commit. After the weekend, the author says that he was in court most all of that Monday morning, but returning to his office, he seen that the DA had left a message on his voicemail simply asking him just to give him a call back. And before he had the chance to sit down and return his call that afternoon, the DA had called yet again, but this time he said an analyst from the crime lab had testified at the trial, and his memory was that the examination of some of the hairs had been what tied Avery to the crime, end quote. The author said that he just thought to himself, yeah, right? Then came the question from him that the author says he will never forget. And that question was, quote, is there anything on Alan in the file? End quote. He says the only way that he could take that question was that he knew all along that Alan had been the attacker and he knew it wasn't Stephen Avery at all and he was trying to cover his tracks, and it sounded like he was wanting him to go along with it. It was the only way he could even think to take that kind of question. The author goes on to say that he believed that the DA had no integrity, because how could he prosecute a man that he knew was actually innocent, and at the same time, allow someone as dangerous as Gregory Allen to remain free? So aside from what Allen had did to Penny in that summer of 1985, he had also stopped and broken into a 17-year-old girl's house that summer, and he held her at knife point. Goes on into talking about rushing the decision to arrest Stephen without even getting with the DA first, and how he could have cut Avery loose at the bell hearing. But with Penny being such a prominent member of the community and how the media was all over every moment of that case, it would have been politically difficult for him to just let Avery go free. Not to even mention the DA had to be reelected every two years then. It would also have been damn near impossible to convict the real criminal in that case and at that point. Seeing as how the sheriff and some deputies as well as the sketch artist had worked so hard to frame Stephen Avery as being the criminal, with the sketch being almost a perfect portrait of Avery and with Penny identifying him in a live lineup, he would also have to go back in front of the jury and explain to them why now she felt like it was Ellen that attacked her and it wasn't Stephen Avery like she had said before. On three different occasions, she had positively called out Stephen Avery as her attacker. The author says he even tried 
to convince himself that maybe the DA really didn't know that Alan was the actual attacker. But the more he tried to convince himself of that, the more he came to the conclusion that there was really no way he did not know that Alan was the real criminal in that case, and it wasn't Stephen Avery at all. And it is true that the DA's office is full of political pressures. You just cannot play politics with an innocent man's life, though. A few days after the crime lab had given us the results that Alan was guilty party, the author says he talked to them several times, and there were three of the staff that worked there at the same time of the trial, and they all said that they thought, even then, that it was Alan who was guilty, not Stephen. And those members had even brought this to the DA's attention before the trial. And he told them that they were mistaken, that he had gotten in touch with Alan's probation officer, who did confirm that Alan had an airtight alibi. And that was one of the many statements that was made by authorities in that case. And it turned out to be nothing but straight lies. He says as he continued to watch episode after episode of Making a Murderer, he was thinking from one extreme to the other between each scene. And at some points, he would be convinced that Stephen was guilty even if it was due to just like a sinister expression that might come across Stephen's face. But then in the next scene, it would put him in a whole different direction and thought that, well, maybe the 16-year-old nephew was used as collateral damage in this case. The discovery of Teresa's vehicle was a big break in the case. Had that vehicle not been found only two days after the police were first called to the property, it is very likely that Stephen would have disposed of it in the car crusher that he had access to on their property, in which case Teresa's murder may have never been solved. You see, shortly after the RAV4 was found on that Saturday, DA Mark R. and the author were called to go to the scene. This was on a Saturday and just five days after Teresa was last seen. The DA called the author and asked him if he could meet him out at the Avery Salvage Yard ASAP. That a volunteer search team had just located the RAV4 and they needed a search warrant ASAP so they could search for any human remains that may be on the property. After the search warrant was in place and the search began, even though the heavy rainfall and the winds that night, the search continued for any human remains. The makeshaft crime lab that was set up on the scene, it was basically a tent with a canopy. Even though this makeshaft crime lab was flapping and moving around in these high winds that night, the weather did not halt the search efforts. And then finally, one of the search dogs alerted on a burn barrel that was about a hundred feet behind Stephen's sister's Barbara's house. Barbara was also Brendan's mother, and he also lived there with her. Later, the remains that the dog alerted to in one of the other four burn barrels that were located were identified as four different types of bone fragments. Then, just a few days later, bone fragments were also identified in the fire pit. Three agents then came to the scene at the fire pit and started sifting through the contents, as well as the ash and the grass around the pit. Very soon, they located more bone fragments, as well as teeth fragments. These findings would later be confirmed by a forensic anthropologist as belonging to an adult human female that was not older than 35 years old. Other evidence uncovered that it could be confirmed that Teresa did arrive at the salvage yard that day. However, she never left, which also confirmed that she was murdered there on the property. This case turned from a missing persons case to a criminal investigation that day. There says that the DA, as well as himself, felt like the wrongful conviction case was still ongoing 
with the lawsuit still pending, we cannot be involved at all in this investigation of Teresa Halbach due to it would be a conflict of interest. From that point on, he was not involved whatsoever in the Halbach case and says that the only information on the case that he was hearing or getting was what the media was putting out. He also says that he had always assumed that finding that RAV4 was the break that they needed. But while watching more episodes, he says that he was shocked at a scene where one of the recordings started to play. It was the one of the dispatchers speaking with Colburn on the radio call-in. Colburn was asking dispatch to run a license plate number. The dispatcher came back saying that the vehicle came back to a missing person by the name of Teresa Halbach. Colburn thanked the dispatcher and ended the call. Then the scene went to Stephen Avery's attorney, Dean Strang, and he was drilling Colburn, who was on the witness stand about why he would have called dispatch to run a check on Teresa's license plates two days before her RAV4 was even found. Colburn even claimed that he did not remember making the call to dispatch about running a check on Teresa's plates, and Strang asked him if he was looking at the plates that he was calling into dispatch that day. Colburn just looked around the courtroom and appeared nervous and did not even answer the question. Strang went on to tell him that he should understand after listening to his own call with dispatch why it would appear he was looking at the plates when he asked the dispatcher to run them. The only answer Colburn gave is what sounded something like, mm, yeah. So this sort of thing continued and episode after episode, the author writes in the book, and he says until it appeared almost evident to the viewers that Stephen Avery had indeed been framed again by the same county, there was the key that was found in Stephen's bedroom floor and this was shown to be planted by Colburn and Link. There was the six spots of Stephen's blood that was found in the RAV4, and this was planted also by using a vial that had been kept in the evidence from a post-relief conviction motion that followed his wrongful conviction, and also the bullet fragment that was found in the garage. It had been fired by Stephen's gun, and it did have traces of Teresa Halbach's DNA on it. But, again, of course, it was planted by either Link or Colburn or maybe even one of the other detectives that was in the garage also that day that it was found. Chapter 4, Sticks and Stones. This chapter starts out with the author talking about how the threats to the Sheriff's Department started coming in only two days after making a murder aired. People were furious that the Sheriff's Department had teamed up with the prosecutors to frame an innocent man again. And this time, they had even went as low as to use his 16-year-old mentally challenged nephew giving a false confession to frame both of them. The Sheriff's Department had gotten well over 200 emails and phone calls of pure hate-filled anger, and this was from people all around the world within just weeks of the airing of the documentary. Some of these calls were so serious and threatening that the FBI had to become involved, and they had to investigate into some of these threats. There were even groups of anonymous people that claimed that they had hacked into computers at the Sheriff's Department and they had found tons of incriminating emails that proved the Sheriff's Department had planted evidence and framed Avery and Dassey. This group said they would make these emails public for all to see within 48 hours. However, it never happened. The supposed emails were never shown anywhere to anyone. Then, of course, the protesters standing in front of the Sheriff's Department holding signs and loudly chanting, What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. It had gotten so bad that three judges just cleared their calendars because they were worried that the protesters would disrupt the court proceedings. The author actually said that he stopped wearing his normal office attire and just started wearing plain street clothes due to the protesters coming into the courthouse 
to use the restroom or just to warm up from being cold outside. Thankfully, the protesters never got really out of hand, aside from a screaming match at one point. The nearby businesses were even given hot chocolate and cookies to the protesters. But eventually, things went from bad to worse, and the Sheriff's Department received a package that was said, quote, for Stephen Avery, end quote. The FBI was contacted to open the package, and it was a glitter bomb, and it exploded upon it being opening, of course, which, thank goodness, it was not a deadly package by mail. The department took the package seriously, though, thinking that the possible next package could possibly be way more sinister. Soon afterwards, the extreme threats did come into the sheriff's office. These threats, though, were very serious. One caller even said, if you don't do it yourself, I will do it for you with a bullet to the head. And if that wasn't enough, dispatch was even receiving calls saying that the sheriff's department employees and prosecutors would be executed inside their own homes on January the 31st, which that day did come and go without any problems, thank goodness. The same threat was made to the prosecutor's office as well. And the FBI said they were going to go ahead and open a file on these threats. The DA even got a threat saying that they were going to murder his child and make him watch. February 2016, and six and a half weeks since the airing of Making a Murder, the Sheriff's Department was still receiving terrible calls and threats. One, in particular, claimed there were bombs planted in the Sheriff's Department and that he was getting justice for Stephen. Then, that same day, but at 9 p.m., another call came in saying a vehicle was outside in the parking lot and it was loaded with explosives and there would be a huge massacre when the bomb went off. Even though the department and the parking lot were cleared by the agencies and bomb-sniffing dogs and everything was declared clear, these threats that continually came in had shaken everyone involved in the judicial system not knowing if the next threat could be real or not, these calls could not even be traced due to them being spooked by a calling router. SWAT members were even dispatched to one of the officer's homes that was in the Making a Murder documentary. This particular officer had really been zoned in on as being a part of the main framing of Stephen. The SWAT team was sent to his house because a neighbor of an officer called in to dispatch that a man with the rifle was outside the officer's front door. However, when the SWAT members arrived at the officer's home, the officer said there had been no one at his front door at all, and he was just fine. So this call was also a hoax, and of course it could not be traced. Things in Manitowoc were absolutely insane. A man was arrested even at a local bar for being disruptive when he was in the back seat of a patrol car and he was being taken to jail, the man just started screaming, Avery, Avery, Avery. The man then told the officer that he was going to kill him and his entire family. The calls and incidents became even more bizarre. In one incident, an officer was dispatched to a home at like 3.45 a.m. because it was reported that a strange man was sitting in the driver's seat of his neighbor's truck. When the officers arrived and approached the man, who was obviously under the influence of what they believed was heroin, they asked him if he knew whose truck he was sitting in, and the man said, Yes, it's Teresa Hawbach's truck, and I'm going to R and kill her, and I'm going to frame Stephen Avery for it. Meanwhile, the petition to President Obama with the half a million signatures that were asking that the president give Avery a full pardon and to hold Manitowoc complicit in Hawbach's murder had made its way to the president's desk. So the White House released a statement regarding that the petition. The statement noted that the president had no power to issue a pardon in a state court sentencing, and the governor of said state would have to be the one to issue the pardon in Wisconsin. After dropping out of the presidential race, Governor Scott Walker also released a statement from the petition that had made its way to his desk. Governor Walker said, I have never issued a pardon during my five years in office, and I will not be starting 
with Stephen Avery. Chapter 5, Convoluted Concerns. The author says that after he did finish the documentary, the question to him was, if Stephen and Brendan didn't murder Teresa Halbach, then who did? The defense used the frame and planted argument, which almost worked, because the jury had deliberated for three days, and one juror even later said that the initial vote from the jury was seven to five in favor of Avery being acquitted. In one instance, the author even says after the series aired, he received an email, and the subject line was kind of shady because the only thing it said was from a concerned citizen. And against his normal judgment, he just went ahead and opened the email, and he followed the link that was included, and it was to a blog page where a man named Brian had obviously done some very extensive research into the Avery and Dassey case. And on this blog was one certain page that was titled Alternate suspect. This page was about a lady who had given information about her husband and how he could possibly have been involved or he could even be the criminal that was behind Teresa's murder. She claimed that she had left her husband and moved near the Avery salvage yard and she said at the time that her husband was acting oddly. The author explains in the book more about the things that she said her husband was doing and the very strange behavior that he was having during this time. She said her husband had told her that he had went to the salvage yard on Halloween, which of course is the day that Teresa was last seen, and she said that Teresa was there because her husband told her that the photographer was stupid and even asked if she could photograph their rental home. This woman also said that her husband had a cut on his hand and it was still bleeding off and on, and that after her husband got home that night, he even had scratches on his back. The author said by that point, he was thinking that this woman's claims and her story was not even real, but he continued to read on regardless. The woman went on to say things like she found a can of lighter fluid a few days later in their shed, and the can also had a bloody fingerprint on it. Her husband had told her he had just burnt a piece of furniture, but she said she checked that furniture and it had not been burned. And there was even an arrest report where her husband had been arrested for domestic violence on the same morning that Teresa's rap for was found, and he was arrested only hours after it was found. Her husband was then arrested just a few months after he broke the order of protection from its wife. She had made this order because he had assaulted her. He was arrested for violation of the order as well as burglary, intimidating a witness, criminal trespassing, among some other charges. The author says after reading this woman's claims that he was just in a state kind of like numb, knowing that if a prosecutor was aware of any of this kind of evidence, that the prosecutor must turn it over to the defense right away. Any small thing that could point to the innocence of Avery must be handed to the defense by the prosecution, no questions even asked. If the evidence is enough to make the prosecution believe that the accused is innocent beyond any reasonable doubt, then the prosecution side will have to get together and they'll have to ask that the case be dismissed. A prosecutor may even have doubt in his mind that the accused is guilty, but if they do not think that they can prove that guilt beyond any reasonable doubt, then the case is legally supposed to be dismissed. The statement that this woman gave about her husband's behavior and that he had said he seen Teresa at the salvage yard the day that she was last seen was absolutely and without a doubt evidence that if the prosecution was aware of, they were obligated to turn it over to the defense. And they must have known about it because the wife also said that she had given all of this information over to the police as well. Maybe the sheriff's department did not pass the information on to the prosecution. If that had happened, 
then these evidence would be considered new evidence and there would be a new trial. And if this woman's statement turned out to be truthful, then this would absolutely be material evidence as well. So the author said he just took it upon himself to forward this email and the information onto the special prosecutor in charge. The woman's report continued to nag at him, though, and how could it be untrue or even exaggerated as detailed as it was? And if this woman was making it up, she had done one hell of a job making herself look very credible. After about a week of hearing nothing back from the email, he started feeling a little bit unsure again. So he emailed the owner of the blog page and he asked him if he would tell him the real name of the woman and her abusive husband that she was talking about. So the blog owner, whose name was Brian, did reply, although he was very vague, and he only typed out two names of the woman and her husband. He also included two case numbers. So the author said he just immediately went to the state's database of crimes, and he entered the first case number. It immediately pulled up the incident, and looking down on the case, he noticed who actually prosecuted this man's case. And it was him. And the case number for the second arrest and a couple of months later also showed that he had also prosecuted that case as well. But regardless of that, what was most important to him was this woman's statement was spot on as far as the arrest she mentioned of her husband. And the details were spot on in the reports as well. So this part of her statement absolutely proved reliable and credible. But he also knew that even if she was truthful about the arrest and where they lived and such as that, that did not really mean that she had not just made up the parts about her husband being at the salvage yard when Teresa was there. As he was leaving his office that day, he said he grabbed the local paper and he walked out. The paper had been headlining just random articles about the Avery and Dassey case almost every day since the series had aired. And that day was no different. This front page article just hit differently with him. He said there was a photocopied letter on it, and that is a letter that Brendan had written to his family. It was the actual letter in Brendan's own scribbly handwriting. So he stopped, and he had to read the letter before he even walked out of his office. It does read, quote, To the people of the world, I am writing to let you know that me and my Uncle Stephen are innocent. The investigators tricked me into saying what they wanted me to say. End quote. Author says after he read that entire letter, he says that he could hardly wait to be able to get his hands on the other files of this woman and her statement about her husband. For the very first time, he thought that maybe Stephen and Brendan really was innocent. Chapter 6. Merry Christmas. Okay, this is going to be a really, really short chapter as far as what I'm covering because I'm really not going to. This whole chapter is not very long, but the entire chapter is pretty much just about the author and his Christmas with him and his family and how his family was also watching Making a Murder and how he spoke with his wife and talked to his wife about um, what he had found out in the blog about this other woman and her husband. Her husband could possibly be involved with the Teresa Halbach murder. He went ahead, I'll just sum it up. He went ahead and he pulled up all of these cases, the woman's domestic violence. There was some pretty bad things that the woman said that her husband did, as well as they were also in the police reports he filed. However, the reason I'm not going to really hit on this chapter much is because it really has nothing to do with the actual case. It has everything to do with his research of the case and him researching this woman and her husband. However, you don't hear about him again throughout the whole book until the very end. And he just puts a short sentence in there saying, you know, well, they weren't involved and she's back with her husband and she later came back and pretty much recanted everything she said. So I'm, there's no reason for me to even go through this woman's whole case and police reports and all such as that because as I was reading the book it was kind of building me up thinking wow but then you hear nothing else until the very end in the little sentence saying they weren't involved so I'm not, I'm not even really going to touch on this chapter we're going to go straight in to chapter 7 again it is an interesting chapter 
and I do recommend, you know, if, if, if you're interested, go read it in the book for yourself. But, but for my point in this synopsis is going over the Avery case and the things that is connected fact and fiction and things of that nature, it's, it's not any, there's not any reason for me to put this chapter in my book synopsis. So let's go straight into chapter seven. Chapter 7, Dead End. And I have to say again, Chapter 7 is more of the same of Chapter 6. It is about the author and his family with Christmas and how they had a snow blizzard. And when he went back to work, he continued to dig in this woman's files. He tried to get a hold of her, different things of that nature. His wife was helping him with this looking into this woman and her husband. And the the whole chapter, even though not a very long chapter, it was all dedicated to this woman and her husband, and her husband being a horrific person, really. Uh, domestic violence, animal abuse, you name it, this guy is just one of those people you don't ever want to be around. But they ended up moving to another country. It's just, it's just continuing on. Really, it has nothing to do with the Avery Dassey case. And so, yeah, not even going to get into it either. Moving on into Chapter 8. Chapter 8. The author goes into this chapter talking about how he was wanting to go into this case and he didn't want to have any bias, you know, and it, it was probably going to be hard for him seeing as he actually worked for the department and he even went as far as being one of the big reasons why Avery was ever exonerated to begin with. So I'm sure it was, it was hell on him, but he wanted to go into this and not be biased whatsoever. He decided what he was going to do is just look at the evidence that the jury had actually looked at during the trial. He says he wasn't really trying to determine if Stephen should be locked up for the rest of his life or if Dassey should spend 32 years behind bars. That really wasn't what he was doing because there had already been two sets of judges and jurors that had already decided all of that. And what he was trying to do was see if these evidence, in his opinion, was reliable. And that was one of the things that the Making a Murder documentary failed to do. And that is to show all of the reliable evidence that were presented to the jury. And seriously, if you plan to come to any sort of actual decision, you have to consider all of the reliable, but the inadmissible evidence that was in the case. And not just show the maybe one-tenth of the things that were shown in the trial, kind of like making murder did. Honestly, when you're blinded of the truth, and it's very easily done, smoke and mirrors kind of thing, it's kind of an illusion, you know, then, then you're not really learning anything. You're seeing the illusion through the magician's mind's eye, how he wants you to see it. But that, that's, that's never something that should ever be done when someone's, you know, life is depending on it or in the justice system, but it is every day. I mean, the author even admits that he almost fell for the whole smoke and mirrors thing himself. You want to believe what you're seeing. You don't want to think that people is painting a picture in smoke and mirrors when it comes to justice. But it happens, believe me. In most documentaries, just to be honest, it does happen. You will see one side or whatever narrative that the producer wants you to see. Because once someone sets their minds to something being the fact and the truth, if they have their minds set on that, it's hard as hell to change those mindsets because it's just human nature. And also knowing that you cannot concentrate totally on one piece of evidence while you're just vaguely or glossing over the other evidence or not even seeing them at all. You're never going to find out the truth. And you also, no matter how hard it is, you should never get your emotions involved. And that is hard to do. Very hard in many, many cases. But the bottom line is you have to weigh both sides and you have to be extremely unbiased to treat both possibilities with the same weight. Guilty and innocent, they have to be treated equally. 
always easy to do this but I'll tell you it's not impossible you just have to have an open mind and like the old saying goes sometimes you can't open a closed mind when someone already has it set in their mind it's hard to open it up to something else some people are just like that but then there is people like me that wants to see the other side and wants to see what they're saying and see if I can even comprehend why how and why they see it that way. The author says in this case, it was very difficult to even find the starting point, aka the trailhead. See, the prosecution had started with the day that Teresa's RAV4 was located on the salvage yard, but this is a whole five days after she went missing. And then there was the defense's side that said that the trailhead began when Colburn called in Teresa's plates to the dispatch to be run, when he was with the vehicle somewhere out in the county a full two days before the RAV4 was found. So the defense argued that Colburn and some other staff at the Sheriff's Department took the RAV4 and they hid it on the Avery salvage yard. So he went with the defense's trailhead is what the author decided to do. And the day Colburn called in the RAV4 plates, he said he set out to find if Colburn really was with the RAV4 two days before it was even located at the salvage yard. The prosecutor's side being that Stephen and Brendan drove Teresa's RAV4 to the spot where it was found and they tried to hide it with all these branches. But the defense side said Colburn spotted this abandoned RAV4 somewhere and called in the plates and found out that it did belong to the missing photographer Teresa Halbach and that her last known location was at Avery Salvage Yard. So Colburn got with some more of the department and he moved the RAV4 onto the Avery property in an effort to frame Stephen for the murder because of the $36 million lawsuit. So was the RAV4 planted or not? So really the only way to form an adequate decision in your own mind is you're going to have to get the actual trial transcripts and you're going to have to take what the Making a Murderer series put out to the world and you're going to have to compare them against each other. So that's what the author did. He said after he got both transcripts, he in the beginning, honestly assumed that both of the scripts would be very, very similar and close to the same, if not the same. But that definitely was not the case. The first thing that was noticed was Colburn's actual full testimony. His testimony had been perfectly edited for the series, that it would be almost impossible to ever notice that the editing was done without comparing these actual transcripts side by side. Parts of his testimony was edited out completely, and it made Colburn look like he answered a question in a way that he had never even answered that question at all. There was also a part of his testimony that explained fully his side of the story and about the plates when he called them in. Now, the author did include the parts of the transcript from Colburn's actual testimony in the book, and all I can say is, wow. The documentary really did cut and splice this guy's testimony in a very, very leading and manipulative way. The actual testimony was far different than what we all watched on Making a Murder. Colburn explained that the reason he had called those plates into dispatch at all was because Calumet Sheriff's Department had given them the plates for the missing woman's vehicle, Teresa Halbach. He was calling into his own dispatcher and department to make damn sure that the plates he was given did come back to Teresa Halbach before he started searching for the vehicle. But for some reason, making a murder did decide that that part of Colburn's testimony wasn't important enough to include into the series for viewers to consider and may be able to form their own opinions off of. There was so much editing and splicing and cutting in the documentary, it was shocking. Colburn's statement about why he called the plates in that day actually does make perfect sense and could have easily been fact-checked by the defense 
if they chose to do so. And just to be honest, had that part of Colburn's testimony been shown in the documentary, I honestly believe that the viewers would have taken his reason he called him in into consideration, especially when the whole theory about the RAV4 being planted there came out. I know it would have made a difference, in my opinion, to be very honest. So when you really think about how the officer did appear to be nervous and sketchy as hell in their testimonies that was shown on Making a Murder, compared to reading and watching the actual trial and testimonies, it's so edited. And it's done on purpose, just, I mean, it is literally done on purpose to try to lead the viewers to believe that the officers were acting so sketchy and nervous and not even answering questions at all, and it made them look like they were scared because they were getting caught. And it was not just the viewers that got that feeling from seeing these guys testifying on the series, but their himself said they even pulled the wool over his eyes. And this was very obviously done by the producers in a very skilled way. Making a Murder even played that clip of Colburn calling in those plates and then making a point to show that that call was made two days before the RAV4 was located. But they did not include Colburn's testimony in this episode of why he called them in to begin with. The few parts of his testimony that were shown were very, very edited, cut, and spliced together to make it look like he was lying and nervous and not even answering their questions. It was ridiculous. Now that I've actually went and read the trial transcripts, watched these things, yes, it is very ridiculous. And that's probably, you know, why they're getting sued for defamation at this very minute, Netflix and the producers. It was already evident at the trailhead that these producers had deliberately distorted the truth for their viewers to see and hear, which was quite honestly a very wrong thing to do. These cuts and edits of this guy's testimony are what tarnished, almost ruined his reputation. There is really no way to scientifically tell if someone is telling the truth or not. That is why polygraph test results are not even admissible in court. There is no 100% way to confirm the truth or a lie without solid proof. So you have to consider all of the facts surrounding the finding of the RAV4 and then the call from Colburn. When the defense's theory rested with Colburn and another phone call where he had received a phone call from a Green Bay detective that could have been the smoking gun in getting Avery released in the Penny Bernstein case. Colburn received the call in 1995, which is 10 years after he was convicted of the crimes against Penny. And it was also eight years before DNA finally did prove that he was innocent. The detective told Colburn that an inmate at the Brown County Jail was claiming that he had assaulted a woman jogging on the beach in Manitowoc County 10 years earlier, and it was presumed that it was Penny Bernstein. The detective even told Colburn that the inmate said that someone else was already convicted for doing it, and they were serving time now for it, and he's innocent. The inmate's name that was laying claim to Penny's attack was Gregory Allen. Now at the time of this call, Colburn was only a corrections officer. Didn't have any experience or even any sort of power to even start to investigate any case. And he had never even heard of Penny Bernstein because it had happened 10 years earlier. But he did do what Prodigal in his job description told him he had to do after he took the call. He passed all of the information up the chain of command. And the information obviously ended up going through all the hands on the way up because the highest hand reached back out to Colburn and told him to stay out of it because they already had the right guy. So after considering all those evidence from both sides and what possible motive or reason either Stephen or Colburn and others would have had to put the RAV4 where it was located. 
It seems like to me, and it honestly seems like the most reasonable answer, is that Avery put it there and tried to camouflage it with all of the debris until he could have time to drain all the fluids from the vehicle, strip all the VIN numbers, and strip the plates, which that was done, and then find time where he could use the car crusher without others being around to ask him why he was crushing an almost new vehicle, and even asking him where it came from. Now, does that not make much more logical sense than Colburn risking his own reputation and possibly going to prison himself by being involved in a setup for Avery? Also, the fact that where the vehicle was found, it would have been hard for anyone that did not live on that property to be able to bring the vehicle right by the Avery's homes, right by the office, and not be noticed at all doing it, not even to mention the fact that the documentary producers obviously had some sort of reason to manipulate the testimony so much and totally leave out Colburn's side of the story about why he even called the plates in. So with this piece of evidence and all things considering, this one really was a win for the prosecution side, in my opinion, as well as the author's. But the author did go on to say that he felt comfortable in forming the opinion that Avery's the one that put that there, but he also had a feeling that as he moved along investigating this case himself, that the next piece of evidence was going to be like a much closer call and it would be harder to choose a side in. Chapter 9, The Key. Now I have this photo up here because I want you to look at it for just a second. A lot of people believe there was multiple, multiple, multiple searches done inside the home. That's just not the case. And I will be explaining later as I go through this book review. However, there was photos taken of the bedroom. Okay, this is a zoomed in picture on the left side of November the 5th. 2005, when there was a photo taken of the bedroom. This is the same area where the key was found. And as you see, the house slippers are in different locations. Now, is it possible that that key could have been under that house slipper? We know Avery didn't do this, right? Because he was in jail when these photos were taken. So my thing is, is it possible that the key could have been under the house slipper? And when they went back in there distinctively to look for the key or blood or any things of that nature like they did on November the 8th? Is it possible when they were going through the book cabinet that the house slippers kind of got moved to the side and there was the key? Or, you know, is it possible like they say it did fall out of the back? I'm thinking it could have fell out of a book that was in the bookshelf anything of that nature. But as you see from the November the 5th photo, the, the shoes are in a different place. If, if the key was there on November the 5th, then it was under the house slipper. But anyway, let's get into chapter 9, the key. The key was probably the most controversial piece of the evidence in this entire case. The key was used for both the prosecution and the defense, but they both have very different theories attached. The prosecution side argued with the theory that Stephen had cleaned the key completely to remove any DNA or blood that he may have left on it himself, not even realizing that it was going to seem very odd when even Teresa Hallbach's prints and DNA were stripped from the key also. As he was transporting the key to hide it to the bookcase table, how likely that his sweat dropped on that key. Hence, why only his DNA was on the key. His plan was to hide the key in the back of a small bookcase until he could have the chance to crush the RAV4 when there was no one else at the yard that could see him do it. You see, the place that the RAV4 was located was actually a pretty damn good distance from Stephen Avery's trailer. Yet, it was in very close proximity to the car crusher. It was only like 380 feet away from the car crusher. Okay, then the defense theory. One of the biggest deals to the defense was that Colburn and Link had been the one to find the key. Manitowoc County was allowed to assist in the search efforts as long as there was an officer 
from another county that was present with them at all times. And seeing as Stephen Avery had the $36 million lawsuit against Manitowoc County, this was an absolute argument that this would have been a conflict of interest to have Manitowoc involved whatsoever in the search of the Avery property. And the fact that a prior search had been conducted already and nothing was found, and the only DNA on the key was Stephen Avery's, Teresa Hallbox should have been on her own key, correct? Okay, Avery's attorney, Buting, argued that there was no way in hell that that key could have gotten there any other way than being planted there. Okay, the author does, in the book, have some of the argument about the key from Stephen Avery's attorney, Buting, from the trial, as well as some transcripts from the trial of Kratz questioning Colburn while he was on the stand. Okay, none of the questioning and answers from Colburn and Link about how they found the key was ever shown on Making a Murderer. However, small and carefully selected parts of the officer that was present from Calumet County, the other county, was shown in Making a Murderer about the finding of the key. These parts of his questioning was highly edited as well as cut and pasted into the wrong places, which totally changed the actual questions and answers. Also, the image of the key in the floor by the slippers was a misleading photo. The photo that was continuously shown on making a murder was taken on a different day than when the key was actually found. Just to be very honest, the key was one of the main, if honestly not the only piece of evidence that had me convinced after watching the documentary that it had to have been planted because there is no way they could have not seen that key on these prior searches. It was in a very visible location, a very visible view. And then the only DNA on the key was Stephen Avery's. Wow. I mean, there is no way it wasn't planted. That's what I thought. How could her key not even have her own DNA on it unless it had been cleaned and then it was tainted with Stephen Avery's. That is what I thought, honestly. Of course, that is what the documentary led us to think. So yeah, my mind went with that fully. In my mind, I had no reason to even question that because it only made sense, right? Wrong. See, that key is what I could not discount even when I tried to understand how the jury just discounted that major fact, I couldn't. Now, after fact-checking what the author said in this book and his words, with the actual trial documents, transcripts, and videos myself, I have to fully admit, the prosecution's theory weighs much heavier, and it is much more believable than the defense's side, I'm just saying. And again, to be honest, I cannot believe I, myself, watched a documentary on a case that I was not the least bit familiar with, and I allowed that documentary to sway my opinion as much as this one did, because I rarely ever go to documentaries made for TV first. In any case, they are most always one-sided, and they leave many unanswered questions, way more usually than any answers. Well, this one kind of didn't do that. It's like, they were on top of the game, and they were answering anything that we may question. So, yeah, I mean, I was consumed in it and com completely went with the producer's narrative. Because, see, I know, I always usually head straight for the court documents and every public record that I can find on the case before I ever even sit down and contemplate a documentary. Like many of you know, I was heavily involved in the Watts case, and I have to be honest, there's a couple of the documentaries I haven't even turned on, because I, there's no reason, I mean, in my opinion. But I can say this, at least the majority of documentaries, they're not going to cut and paste and splice parts of trials and, and things like Don't do that. I mean, they may just put the parts they want you to see, but... The cutting and the splicing and the editing that I have seen done with this making a murderer is, is crazy. And they also have this way of making everything look so 
gloomy. Like in the middle of scenes throughout the whole documentary, they would they would play scenes like, you know, it was just a cold, hard winter, seagulls crying and taking flight in the background, hard times, depressing sounding music, but it worked for one hell of a sympathy pull from the viewers. It all worked awesome for me, to be totally honest, and I was sucked right into they are innocent. There is no other way to see it kind of bandwagon. And to be honest, I'm very embarrassed uh, to even admit that to you right now. But yes, I was. Chapter 10, The Blood. Stephen Avery's attorney, Jerome Buting, said that finding this vial of blood was a red letter day. See, they found this when they asked to have access to the files from Stephen Avery's wrongful conviction case. The files from that case was basically a box full of random documents and evidence exhibits from the Penny Bernstein case. This box had been setting since an appeal of that conviction was made a decade earlier. When Buting arrived at his scheduled appointment time to pick up the box, he saw that it was setting unattended behind the counter, and inside the box, the blood vial was discovered. It was theorized that this vial is exactly how the sheriff's office staff would be able to obtain the blood that belonged to Stephen. They took it from the vial, and they planted it in Teresa Hallbox RAV4. Now, in the documentary, it was a huge part of the series when the vial was found, and there was a small hole in the rubber topper, and it did look like a syringe had been inserted into the rubber top and blood drawn out, which could have been used to plant blood in the RAV4. Anyone that's not real familiar with the medical field and how blood is actually drawn could easily believe that, right? But you know, you got to give the producers credit here. I mean, it was an amazing theory, no doubt. However, Personally, I've worked in the medical field, and I knew the hole was not anything unusual to see in an unopened vial. The hole in the top is how the blood got into the vial to begin with. And of course, Stephen Avery's attorneys really did not even use the vial finding in the trial. It's either because they knew that that theory held absolutely no merit at all, or it could be because they were also aware that the nurse that actually drew the blood and put it into this vial in 1996 for his second appeal she was subpoenaed to that trial and she was just sitting there waiting to be called up as a witness as to why the hole was in the top of the vial so i'm not even sure why the producers chose to even put that part in the documentary there was obviously nothing strange or odd about the vial or about the hole in the top of it the only reason I can figure they decided to put that in there was just for suspense of it going into the next episode. Possibly some people may still believe that that vial is how they obtained Stephen's blood because it had the hole in the top. I don't even know, but it really was not a good scene to have in there, just to be honest. I thought when, that was kind of a pointless scene. Buting did say on Dateline, though, after the documentary, that there was blood between the rubber stopper and the vial. And he said that there is no way that that blood could have gotten under the rubber stopper unless the stopper had been removed at some point. But a man who is not involved in this case whatsoever, but he is the national writer for the Blood Draws Incorporation of America, he totally debunked Buting on that theory, he said that with 100% certainty that the blood being trapped under the rubber top was not a sinister thing at all. It is expected because the rubber stopper is not airtight close to the bottom of the stopper, and the blood is always going to seep under the stopper just a bit. But what about the broken evidence tape that was on the box? That the vial was in. Someone had to have opened that box, right? Okay, now just on a side note, the author does give some pretty interesting fact checking information about how blood is drawn by a couple of different methods, both of which is going to leave a hole in the rubber stopper in the top of the vial. How else are you going to? 
Chapter 11, EDTA. What is EDTA? Anytime a blood specimen is collected for forensic testing, there is always a tiny bit of chemical added to the blood that is called EDTA. This is added to the specimen so as it does not degrade over time. Our actual blood in our body does not have EDTA in it, of course, which means what? That there should not even be one tiny trace of EDT found in Stephen Avery's blood that was found in the RAV4, right? But if Stephen Avery's blood that was found in the RAV4 did show even a tiny trace of EDTA, then it would be a bull's eye target that the vial was tampered with and the blood by the ignition switch had been taken from that vial. That test came back negative for EDTA. So the blood that was found in Teresa Halbach's vehicle had never been in any vial ever and Stephen Avery's blood was absolutely by the ignition switch. And of course, his own blood had to have came out of his body, right? So, okay, there's also the fact and the photos that prove he did have an open cut on his finger a few days later when the police spoke with him. Also the fact that Brendan Dassey did say that Stephen Avery drove her RAV4 where it was found by the car crusher after driving it to the pond, and that was the original plan to dispose of Teresa Halbach's body. That was according to Brendan Dassey anyway. Stephen Avery's blood being in that RAV4 was the most important piece for both the prosecution and, of course, the defense. There was some back and forth motions on whether to make the vial admissible in the trial or not. A DNA expert even said if the blood in the RAV4 was tested and it did not contain any EDTA, then it absolutely did not come from the vial. The judge finally told both sides that he would not allow the vial to even be mentioned in court unless the blood in the RAV4 tested for EDTA. Now the author goes into details about the motions that was filed in the DNA expert testimony. So after a whole lot of back and forth, the judge did grant that the prosecution would have permission to have the blood tested, saying that he does believe that the test results could very well be very important in the trial for both the prosecution and the defense. Now the author also talks about how the juries are all different as well, and they are, saying that most of the time they get it right, but sometimes they can get it very wrong. And he kind of gives examples of taking a hundred different jurors and presenting them each with the same exact trial, the same exact witnesses, and even evidence. And they will not always all come to the same conclusion and verdict. And I totally agree. People do perceive things differently. I've always said that. It's just the way it is. We're not always all going to agree or see things the same way. So just because Stephen Avery's jury found him guilty, that does not mean that he is guilty. It just means that was the conclusion that those 12 people came to an agreement that he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, which the blood being tested by the FBI and returning with a negative EDTA find in the RAV4 blood. So I'm pretty sure that test held a large part of why and how they came to the verdict beyond a reasonable doubt. Now also in the book, the whole testimony of this highly accredited FBI forensic lab tester is written word for word, which is very interesting actually. But just to summarize what he did testify to in trial, is that he was part of the testing t at the FBI lab in Virginia. And he's the one that tested the swabs of blood that came out of the RAV4 as well as the vial. He testified that none of the swabs from the RAV4 had any trace 
of EDTA whatsoever. However, the blood inside the vial had a significant amount of EDTA. So the blood in the RAV4 absolutely did not come from that vial whatsoever. This witness also explained exactly what ADT was and how it works and why it is used when drawing blood to be preserved. Also, the defense had retained an expert witness themselves, and their expert was very convincing as well. This witness also had high credibility and was an expert that worked in the government labs for many years, and she also testified. Now, the extended version of her testimony, of course, is in the books, but the highlights of her testimony was the fact that the EDTA is not detected in the blood stains in the RAP4 does not mean that EDTA was not present in the stain. It's told the jurors that the FBI's claim detection is theoretical and did not account for complicating factors associated with taking a real world sample and getting it to the point where it is clean and pristine enough to be able to inject it into an instrument. And among the problems were the swabbing of the blood stain and the extracting the sample from the stain and diluting it before you get it into the instrument. And then the problem is you do not know if you did not detect the EDTA because there was none there or because your detection limit wasn't low enough to see it. Even if it had been there, that's the problem. She also disagreed with the prosecution's witness in the decision to test only three of the six blood stains of Stephen Avery's that was found in Teresa Halbach's vehicle. Now, the author agrees with what the prosecution's witness has said. The prosecution could not prove beyond any reasonable doubt that it was a fact that Stephen's blood was not planted in the RAV4, and the defense could not prove that the blood was planted in there either. So the jury had to decide from the evidence and both side arguments, as well as the expert witness called to testify, which side seemed the most logical and credible. And just like with the RAV4 and the key finding, the jury pretty much had to form their own opinions from the evidence and credibility they put into everything that was given to them. Chapter 12, A Reprieve. The author said that he remembered back to the case in 1985 and was trying to figure out why he even got involved in Stephen Avery's case. He says on the morning of September the 5th, 2003, he had received a call from an analyst at the crime lab and they had just finished testing the very last piece of evidence in the Penny Bernstein case, and it was only one single pubic hair, a convicted SO named Gregory Allen, and he was known for a string of sexual violence. After the phone call about the DNA coming back on Allen, the prosecuting DA was informed of the findings, yet he was not concerned at all that Stephen had been wrongfully convicted for a crime for the past 18 years. Stephen Avery's wrongful conviction was a mistake. This was proven. It was a total plan, and it was misconduct of the sheriff and the district attorney and a few others to pin the crime on Stephen due to their huge dislike of the Avery family. They had found out that he was not the person that attacked Penny, but they chose to intentionally send him to prison. Now, the author goes on to say, at least that is the way it looked to him and many others. Stephen became like a hero overnight, doing news interviews and even having his photo taken with the governor. There was even, quote, the Avery Bill, end quote. That was even passed. Stephen Avery was going to be a voice for all of those wrongfully convicted. Now let's move back to the Teresa Halbach case. The defense filed a motion concerning third-party liability. And what that means is there were others that should be considered as suspects in this case. Those that could possibly be identified as third-party, that would actually be every customer at the salvage yard, every 
friend of the family, every member of the Avery family that was at the salvage yard during the hours that she was there. The motion did hold water, though, because Stephen was not the only member of the Avery family who had a criminal background. See, Chuck, his oldest brother, actually had a pretty violent past. One of those was an incident that he did to his ex-wife only six years prior. She even accused him of aring her and trying to even strangle her with a telephone cord. Then there was his younger brother, Earl, who was convicted of battery and essay in 1992, and yes, to his own wife. And both Chuck and Earl were there at the salvage yard the day that Teresa Halbach was murdered. If the prosecution could just convince one or two of the jury that it is a possibility that one or both of the brothers committed the crime and it wasn't Stephen, then Stephen could walk away a free man. The judge did not allow this motion, though, stating that the brothers did not demonstrate motive or evidence to this crime. So with this being denied by the judge, the defense only had the reasonable doubt to push over to the jury. The judge even denied the state's motion to exclude the blood vial as part of the frame-up evidence. The defense could use the vial and the planting of the blood in Teresa Hallbach's RAV4 and intertwine that into the wrongful conviction of Penny Bernstein as well. Now with the vial as well as the allegations that the RAV4 was all planted on the salvage yard and the key in the bedroom and with having Stephen having the high-profile seasoned attorney team that he had of beating and strain, there was a possibility that he could walk out a free man. Now, Kratz did offer Brendan Dassey a plea deal for the chance of parole after serving 15 years if he would testify against Stephen about exactly what happened. But seeing as how the Avery family is very, very close and they're very protective of each other, and even Stephen Avery's dad, which is Brendan's grandfather, Alan, would obviously ask Brendan not to take the deal and don't testify against Stephen. And, as we assume, Brendan did not accept the plea deal. Now, on February the 5th, 2007, about 15 months after Teresa Hallbach's RAV4 was located, the trial began with the opening statements. Buting actually owned the courtroom with his very convincing and sincere tone of how they need to get it right this time. And then the next day, Kratz started with the timeline and presenting the court the paper trail of Teresa Hallbach on October the 31st of 2005. Then came the prosecution's physical evidence, the remains found in Barb's burn barrel and Stephen Avery's fire pit that was right behind his trailer. The skull was intact enough for an expert to testify where Teresa Hallbach was shot and which side and even how many times, which was all exactly what Brendan Dassey had already confessed to during his interrogation. Expert testimony also declared that there was only a one in a billion chance that the bone fragments found in the barrel and pit did not belong to Teresa Hallbach. This expert also testified that the DNA lifted from Teresa Hallbach's car as well as her key both belonged to Stephen Avery. And during the cross-examination, Buting tore up the experts and investigating officers for their lack of caution and following procedure and how they even failed to find a bullet fragment that contained Teresa Hallbach's DNA until months later in the garage. And he also referred to the bullet as, quote, the magic bullet, end quote. Buting asked one of the officers that was there on November the 6th if he had seen a bullet in the garage. Or answered he had not. Kratz called up the officer from the other county that assisted Colburn and Link in the search when the key was found asking the officer if Colburn and Link was out of his eyesight long enough to place the key where it was found, to which this officer said no. Bobby Dassey, who is Brendan's older brother, was called to the stand the following day 
and he testified that he saw a girl walking towards his Uncle Stephen's trailer at 2.45 p.m. on Halloween day. He also said that Stephen Avery asked him a few days later if he wanted to help hide a body. But then he laughed and said that Stephen told him Teresa Halbach probably just went to Mexico. Brendan's other brother, Blaine, also testified and said that he had seen a huge bonfire behind Stephen's house Halloween night. He said that he seen someone buy it, but he couldn't remember or make out who it was. And then the next morning at 9 a.m., the jury sent the judge a note that was requesting a magnifying glass. And the judge told them that they were not to conduct the investigation themselves, and they were to base their decision based on the evidence in the record and nothing more. The jury still had not reached a verdict by 6 p.m., by this point, they had sat through five weeks of testimony already. And in the next morning, the jury deliberated for a short period of time before they sent the judge yet another note. They asked to review the cross-examination of Buting's testimony of the crime lab analysis. Now, there were two main things that Buting accomplished during his cross-examination was that Stephen Avery's DNA was not found on the trigger of the shotgun that Teresa Halbach was allegedly shot with, nor was Teresa Halbach's blood on the barrel of the weapon. So the judge decided that the jury should hear the entire testimony of the analyst and not just the cross-examination. So the judge called the jury and he read them himself the entire testimony the analyst had given. And then three days later, the bailiff finally made the announcement that the jury had reached a verdict. Stephen Avery, first degree intentional homicide, guilty. Mutilating a corpse, not guilty. Stephen Avery would spend the rest of his life in prison. Chapter 13, Bullets and Bones. Within hours of Brennan's confession, a new search warrant was issued for Stephen's bedroom and garage. In the garage, two bullets were found. One was fully intact, while the other was in fragments. One was found inside of a crack closer to the front of the garage, and the other was found the next day under an air compressor in the back of the garage. A firearms expert confirmed that the second bullet was fired from Avery's weapon as well as DNA from Teresa Halbach was confirmed on the bullet. He also went on to say that the bullet did come from the weapon that was found hanging over Stephen's bed and no other than that gun. Buting argued that the analyst that tested the bullet made a mistake and contaminated the control sample and that her own DNA, probably saliva, is what contaminated it. However, this in no way affected the results of the testing as it was the control sample and not the biological material found on the bullet itself. The author goes on to talk about and explain in detail about this being the same analyst that was the one that tested the single pubic hair and helped get Stephen exonerated in Penny's case. She is a professional and had tested the truth about the DNA belonging to Gregory Allen in Stephen's wrongful conviction case. More testing then confirmed what Brendan Dassey had said, which was Teresa Halbach was shot inside of the garage. Luminol was sprayed on the floor of the garage, and it proved that some blood had been in the northeast corner of the garage. Another area proved that blood had also been on an area west and north on the garage floor behind the lawn tractor and the snowmobile. The second place also aligned perfectly with a sketch that Brendan had drawn for police that did indicate where him and Stephen had used Teresa Hobbock's clothing to clean up her own blood on the floor of the garage before they burned her clothing. This testing was assisted by a crime lab forensic scientist on November the 8th of 2005. 
and this forensic scientist also testified that this was not just a spot on the floor. It was more like a smear, and it was roughly three to four foot in diameter. Now in the book, it also has the testimonies of the officers that found the bullets in the garage and how they found them. Making a murder really did make it appear that the bullets in the garage was also found by Colburn and Lake, and that is not true at all. Colburn and Lake did not participate whatsoever in the search of the garage. Now, in prior searches, police had little to nothing to really go on about how Teresa was even killed or where she was killed. But when Brendan made his confession, that is what prompted the search of the garage. Even though the public was not aware of this information, the detectives had known since February the 28th that Teresa Halbach had been shot in the head. This was due to the remains and the partial skull that was found early on because there was lead traces left from the bullet hole in her skull. Now it was on March the 1st that Brendan Dassey confessed that Stephen Avery had shot Teresa in the garage. Brendan finally confessed to this after they just came out and asked him what happened to her head, who shot her. People assume from this short clip of the hours-long interrogation of Brendan's that Brendan just guessed in an answer to give the investigators what they wanted to hear. And it was that very same day that search warrants went out to search the garage for the bullets and the blood and where the bullets were located. They could have easily overlooked and not seen those on prior searches, especially when they were not even told to be searching specifically for bullets. Now, another very incriminating part of Brendan's confession is this diagram that he drew for the police, and it showed where Stephen Avery had shot Teresa in the garage. Now, the luminol test shined exactly where Brendan had drawn where Teresa had been shot. The bullet that was found lodged under the air compressor had most likely exited soft tissue, possibly a cheek or a shoulder, and this is the bullet that contained Teresa Halbach's DNA. Upon the search of the bedroom, there was absolutely nothing in there that aligned with what Brendan Dassey had claimed had happened inside the bedroom. There was no blood, no hair, nothing at all that linked to Teresa Halbach ever even being in that bedroom. Now, the author does go on to talk about the physical evidence from the garage and the RAV4 having Stephen Avery's blood inside being enough in itself to prove that Stephen was guilty. He also speaks about the acts that Stephen had done for decades, including what he'd done the night before Teresa Hallbach's murder, and that was inviting one of his nephew's underage girlfriends over to his house to have rough sex with him. Within days of finding the RAV4, two burn sites were located. Both contained Teresa Hallbach's charred remains. Behind Brendan's house in a field, there was a burn barrel that contained at least four different types of human bones. And then in a burn pit behind Stephen's garage, more bones were found, as well as skull fragments and even a tibia. And there was enough tissue left on this tibia to be positively identified by DNA as being Teresa Halbach and even metal rivets that came off Teresa's jeans. Later on, there were bone fragments found that was off of the Avery property. It was at a quarry. But these bones, with the exception of only three, that could have possibly been a human pelvis, but that was not confirmed. All the other bones there at the quarry were animal bones. The biggest part of Teresa Hallbach's bones was located in the pit and the grassy area around the pit. This pit was only 20 yards from Stephen Avery's bedroom window. An expert anthropologist testified that almost every bone, or at least bone fragment, 
from every bone below the neck was found in that burn pit. She also went on to say that it was highly unlikely that the bones had been moved to the pit from anywhere else. Now, the defense also retained an expert witness on bones who had not even analyzed the bones that were found, had not even seen them in any way other than a few photos. But this witness did testify that it was possible that the bones could have been transported and moved to the pit. A witness from the Arson Bureau of Wisconsin testified that he investigated the burn pit and was almost certain that the charred bone fragments had been burned right there in the pit and were not moved from any other location. He said that he also found wiring from more than five steel belted radial tires also in the pit, and some of them had bone fragments entangled inside the wire, some deeply inside to the point that he had to physically pull apart the wire in order just to get in there and look. He also said that Teresa Hallbach's bones could not have been thrown on top of the wire after the fact, had to have been burned with those tires the way they were found, with the fragments intertwined with the wires. He also found a rake with wires from the steel belted tires in its teeth and assumed that the rake was used to steer around the fire. Also found was a spade shovel and a screwdriver, assumed to have been used to chop up the bones as the fire died down. Earl, Stephen's brother, also told investigators that on Wednesday, November the 2nd, Steve had asked Brendan to take the tire rims and wire out of the burn pit and to put them on the large pile of tires out in the salvage yard. Earl said that he thought that was weird because the rims and the wire had already been taken out of the pit burn area and set beside it for Brendan to pick up later. Chapter 14. Who is Stephen Avery? It is good to always know someone's character. I mean, a person is who they are, correct? Obviously. So it's nice to know, even if you don't want to think about their past or their characteristics from the past, it still needs to be known. Stephen Avery was actually a pretty common name around the courthouse and the people there and the people that worked there. There was things like the cat burning incident to even wrecking into the deputy's wife's car and holding her at gunpoint with her infant daughter in the car. There was several other things as well. He was no stranger to the police and courts, believe that. So when he was exonerated and he walked out free, not even having probation, no strings or anything attached to his exoneration, people around the courthouse knew that it was really only a matter of time before he would be back. You know, kind of cutting little kind of snide jokes like, well, he's on vacation or how much you want to bet it's going to be two months, six months, a year down the line, you know, things like that. Stephen admitted to the Milwaukee Journal that sometimes he would cry because his twin boys wanted nothing to do with him. He also admitted that he was depressed a lot and sometimes it would last all day. And he tried to stay away from everybody. Sometimes he even cussed people out and sometimes he'd just go for a ride. He said there was too much going on inside his brain to deal with it. He even complained about not being offered help when he was released, saying that they just let you walk out the door. But he also went on to say almost in the same breath that even if they would, have offered him help, he would have refused it. But he went on to say that he didn't really want to go back to prison, but sometimes it's just easier in there. Just put me back in there and get it over with, he said. Shortly after Stephen was released from prison, he hooked up with his sister Barb's neighbor. She was living in a rented trailer close to her house. Her name was Jody. Stephen soon moved into Jody's trailer with her. So yes, the trailer you're all seeing was not Stephen's ever. It was Jody's. He had moved in with her. 
when he got out of prison. But here's the thing, soon after he moved into her trailer, it wasn't very long before she had to call the police to him. Jody had went to the races while Stephen was gone, and she had not told him that she was going anywhere. So this did not go over well at all for Stephen. When Jody got home at around 11 p.m., they got into an argument, and Jody told him just to pack his stuff and get out. Stephen pushed her and caused her to fall over a chair, and she hit her head. Stephen got on top of her, telling her that he should just kill her. When she tried to call 911, he ripped the phone completely out of the wall. He also went on to strangle her until she passed out, and then he drug her out to the car where she finally regained consciousness. Stephen told her, I should just get my gun and kill you. Later, Jody did drop the charges, so his charge was dropped to a disorderly conduct instead of any criminal charges. Right after making a murderer heir, Jody said in a public interview that the way she acted during the filming of Making a Murderer, which was a decade earlier, was all coerced and done due to Stephen threatening her if she said anything against him. Now this is verbatim, of course, and the author tells in the book the exact words and in interviews about her time on Making a Murder, as well as all of her interviews a decade later. Jody says that Stephen is not innocent, and she does believe that he did kill Teresa Halbach. She said once that she ate two boxes of rat poisoning just to get to go to the hospital, to be able to get away from him and to be able to tell the police to try and help her. Police reports also showed that five months before the Teresa Halbach trial even began, on September the 13th of 2006, investigators from Calumet County interviewed Jody's mother. Jody's mother and her husband had custody of Jody's 13-year-old daughter. They had stopped letting her go visit Jody because of Stephen. The 13-year-old would cry and did not want to go there because she hated Stephen Avery. Anytime Jody's mother wanted to talk to Jody on the phone, they had to go through Stephen first. Once Stephen even threatened Jody's mother, telling her that he would have Jody's daughter taken away from them and put into a foster home. Stephen had beaten Jody right in front of her daughter and told her that he would kill her and nobody would ever miss her. Once Jody and her daughter locked themselves in the bathroom, they thought Stephen was pouring gas around the trailer and was going to light it on fire. The author also adds a note into the book that the 13-year-old had written to her grandparents. and This was about a time that she was at her mom's house and Stephen was there. The little girl says how much she disliked Stephen and wished that he would just go to prison. More court records also show that Stephen Avery is a very sick man. He's riddled with violence, dehumanizing women and children, and full of sexual rage. Unfortunately, in any case, the general rule is that any other acts other than the crime for which one is charged with is not admissible in a trial due to the reason of the jury possibly thinking, well, if he did that, then I'm sure he did this also. Sometimes, though, on a rare occasion, the prosecution can persuade the judge to let other acts be presented to be admissible. That does not happen very often at all. In this case, the prosecution did ask that other acts be admissible due to them being relevant to the motive, intent, and plan. One act that involved Stephen Avery's own niece. On January the 23rd of 2006, while Stephen was still incarcerated, awaiting the trial of Teresa Halbach, his niece talked with the Calumet officer, Wendy Baldwin. She told the officer about her relationship with her uncle Stephen. She was 17 years old when he was released from prison. After he was released, she said that she did hang around with him. She would go fishing and things like that. But then he started asking her to meet him at Walmart and help him pick up things for the trailer. He always bragged about his money, and he would get mad if she didn't meet with him. She said she started to feel uncomfortable around him when he started kissing her, and she left. Now understand, this is all verbatim, 
and her actual words are all in the book, of course. But the niece also continues to talk with the officer, and she eventually starts crying while trying to tell the officer that her 42-year-old uncle, Stephen Avery, aired her on her cousin's bunk bed. She cried, seriously hurt, and asked him to please stop, and he just laughed and told her that it was meant to be, and he was going to marry her when he got his money. She said she kept telling him no, and she tried to get him away from her. She continued to try to pull away. She said that he would spread her legs with his elbows. She was crying harder, very emotional, just trying to tell bits of this traumatic memory to the officer. He would also threaten to burn her family's house down if she did not do exactly what he told her to do. She said when she heard that he may be released on bond, she was terrified. She would not even stay home by herself. She even told her manager at work that she would not work alone if he got out of prison. The judge was concerned that these other acts were of inflammatory nature and made his decision that these other acts, reports, and files all be sealed and not mention this in the trial due to this likely poisoning the jury. But soon after the trial, these files and reports were unsealed and they are all readily available online and they are public records and i'll have to tell you i have looked at them it's horrendous and there is even photos of stephen wearing nothing but his underwear with his niece so yes i absolutely believe her there was even another record that went back to when he was still married to his wife lori and there was a girl and she was 17 years old when she stayed there with his wife she's now 42 or she was 42 at the writing of the book and she had been staying with them and she said she was laying on the couch and Stephen came in and just started fondling her. When she told him to stop, he put his hand over her mouth and he proceeded to R her. He told her that there would be a lot of trouble if she even tried to yell or scream. A most recent act from a 17 year old she told a special agent that Stephen Avery had called her on her cell phone the day before Teresa Halbach disappeared, and he told her if she wanted to come to his trailer and to have a little fun, he told her that they would make the bed hit the wall real hard, and she told him that he was wasting her cell phone minutes and she hung up on him. And there's also the records of the physical violence. This goes all the way back to his ex-wife, Lori. Lori had stayed at the domestic violence shelter several many times during their marriage due to him beating her during their marriage. She was terrified of Stephen and he finally started threatening her, saying that he would kill her if she ever tried to leave him again. She said that her beatings and abuse were so extreme that she believes he would have ended up killing her if he had not been incarcerated in 1985. Even after he was incarcerated, he continued to threaten her through letters, telling her and her children that he was going to kill her. Now, some of these letters are actually in the book. They're also readily available online. So it is very true that he threatened her many times while he was in prison. Now let's go back to Jody, the girlfriend on making a murder. The night that Stephen strangled her and drug her out the door while she was unconscious, she had opened up and told more about this act. All of that is in the book. However, many people do believe that Jody made up these things after making murder, but what she has said was absolutely confirmed by Stephen Avery himself on a recorded jail call with Jody on January the 27th of 2006. Stephen asked her to deny to anyone that he had ever abused her. He told her, quote, that if she loved him, she would tell the police that she just fell down while she was drunk and that's how she got all the bruises, end quote. Another act that the prosecution wanted to present was the burning and torturing of the family cat. 
which prove Stephen Avery has a very sadistic personality and even showed a striking similarity of what had been done to Teresa Halbach's body. Another act, while Avery was incarcerated, he had told fellow inmates that he planned to build a torture chamber when he was released. He told them all about his plan to R, torture, and murder young women. Also, his blueprints and floor plan of this torture chamber that he drew himself is also online. So given the fact that despite all of the provable and recorded other acts of Stephen's past criminal and characteristic history, and the fact that the judge did not grant the prosecution's request to make these admissible to the trial, and instead ordered these acts to be sealed until after the trial because of the possibility that these acts could turn the jury prejudiced as if none of these acts were relevant to the crime Avery was being tried for. I have to say, Stephen Avery did have a very fair and balanced trial, more so than what he deserved, in my opinion. Chapter 15 A Mountain of Evidence and a Molehill of Doubt Comparing Stephen's past criminal acts to the case of Teresa Halbach may not have been admissible in his trial. However, I personally do believe that his past proven and confirmed actions do coincide, sadly, with Teresa Halbach's murder. And as they say, a zebra really never changes his stripes. As his past makes it very evident, he has no respect for women whatsoever. He does not have even one female from his past that has came out and said that he was even a half-ass good boyfriend or husband. All have came out to tell how they were abused and used by Stephen Avery not to even mention the incest in underage females or the extreme disregard for animals' life. And I always have to think, these acts are just the ones that we know about, the ones that he was caught and charged for. And you have to know if all of these things that he was caught for and charged for, what about the ones that are not known? The ones he was not caught for? And from seeing and hearing his past, I feel very comfortable in saying, I'm sure there are many. And for Teresa Halbach, he was the last proven person to ever see her alive and the last to ever speak to her. In my opinion, that does say a lot. Now, it is totally understood that even though Stephen Avery's past is so disturbing, that does not mean that he is a murderer. His conduct before, during, and after Teresa Halbach's murders, though, could be very telling. The first time a photographer from the Auto Trader magazine went to Avery's salvage yard to photo a vehicle was January the 25th of 2005. The photographer's name was Allison. When she got there, she knocked on Stephen Avery's door, and he told her that he would be right out. While she was waiting for him to come out, she went ahead and took some photos of the vehicle. She then asked Stephen what he would like written with the vehicles in the magazine, and he told her that he had not written up anything for it yet, so he went inside to write up a few lines for her to print with the photos. He was inside the trailer for quite some time when he finally opened the door and asked her if she wanted to come inside while he wrote it up. Of course she refused, telling him that it was against company policy to go inside a customer's home and she would just wait for him in her car. She later said that he totally creeped her out the way he stared at her. The Averys went on to use the Auto Trader magazine a few more times, but on October the 10th of 2005, Teresa Halbach went to the Avery Salvage Yard to photograph a 1984 Pontiac Grand Prix. Stephen Avery had called into Auto Trader and asked specifically for Teresa to come and take the photos. When she got there, the vehicle that she was to be photographing was parked right in front of Stephen Avery's garage. Teresa had been to the yard before 
and she had photographed vehicles for the family. But this time, the vehicle they needed photographed was parked very close to Stephen Avery's trailer. And in prior appointments, the vehicles had been parked up front by the office or even closer to Barb's house. An employee at Auto Trader said that Teresa told her that Stephen Avery came to the door wearing only a towel, and this made her very uncomfortable. After all, this was a set appointment made by Stephen Avery himself. So he was well aware when she would be arriving and to greet her at his door in only a towel was not acceptable, nor was it a mistake of her arriving unexpectedly or out of the blue. Not to mention, he obviously had everything planned out that day around Teresa arriving at his trailer. Because before lunch, he had even told his brother Earl that he had to go home because he was meeting with someone from the magazine. Now, Stephen was questioned just after Teresa's disappearance when he and Brendan Dassey were at the family's cabin up north. They were asked if it was common for him just to leave work at the yard at 11 a.m. and not come back after dinner. And Stephen Avery actually told them, no, it was not common at all. This was the first time that he had ever left work. Now, the author has more of this questioning by the detective while he was up in the cabin in the book. There was another co-worker that said that Teresa Halbach had been receiving calls on her phone that came up as an unknown number. The caller would never leave a message. This co-worker also said that Teresa Halbach had also mentioned that one of her customers had tried to invite her into his residence and had made some very uncomfortable comments to her as well. The remarks were uncomfortable enough to Teresa Halbach that she just left the premises. It is now known that on October the 9th of 2005, Stephen purchased ankle and wrist cuffs. This is the day before he called Teresa Halbach and requested that only her was to come to his trailer to photograph the Grand Prix when he came to the door wearing nothing but a towel on October the 10th. Stephen Avery's girlfriend, Jody, was not at the trailer on this date as she was incarcerated. Now fast forward a few weeks to Halloween, October the 31st. The vehicle that Stephen had called in to be photographed by Teresa specifically was a van. But the thing with this van is, it did not even belong to Stephen. The van belonged to his sister Barb. And she said that the van was not even for sale at all. She was saving it for one of her sons. And it should not have been being photographed whatsoever for Auto Trader magazine. When Stephen called into Auto Trader at 8 a.m. on October the 31st when they opened, the receptionist that took his call said he identified himself as B. Jonda, which his sister's name is Barb Jonda. He gave Barb's home phone number and address, and he said he wanted the same photographer to come out this time that had been there before, which was Teresa Halbach. Stephen giving his sister's phone number when he was well aware that Barb would not even be at home when Teresa arrived because she would be at work. So giving her phone number instead of his own was a huge red flag, not to even mention that the vehicle wasn't even for sale at all and didn't even belong to Stephen. And when Teresa was given the job note for that afternoon, she had no clue that it would be Stephen Avery that she would be meeting at the yard that day. Had she have known it was him, there is a huge likely that she would not have even went, or she would have had someone to go with her. That's how he had made her feel extremely uncomfortable the last time she was there on October the 10th, and coming to the door in a towel, and even the uncomfortable comments and stares he was giving her. Now, on Making a Murder, you can hear Teresa Halbach's message about the appointment and what time she would be arriving. But what Making a Murder did not tell you is that the message came from Barb's answering machine. It did not come from Stephen Avery's phone. Barb's answering machine picked it up from her home phone number that Stephen Avery had given them as a contact. 
and he knew that no one would be there to take the call. Viewers of Making a Murder was led to believe by hearing that recording that Teresa Halbach was not concerned at all about going to the salvage yard that day. And we all assumed that the message was for Stephen Avery, and that is not true. The message was for B. Jonda, and Teresa Halbach did not even have the address to the vehicle at the time she made that call. If you will re-listen to it, she even says in the message that she is going to have to have a return call and she needs an address to go to. So she had absolutely no clue that it was Stephen Avery. Phone records show that Stephen Avery called Teresa from his cell phone at 2.25 p.m. and he was using the star 67 option to hide his own phone number. Now this is around the same time that Teresa Halbach left her last job. So at 2.27 p.m., Teresa received a call from Auto Trader with the address to B. Jonda's residence for her next job. And she told the receptionist that she was on her way right now. At 2.35 p.m., Stephen tried calling Teresa again using the star 67 function. The call had a zero minutes talk on the phone records. So Teresa obviously did not even answer the anonymous call. More details of Stephen Avery's phone records also show that he made 14 calls the day of October the 31st, 2005 from his cell phone. There were only two calls where he used that star 67 function and those were both to Teresa Halbach. The other calls that he made that day were four to his family, one to Teresa Halbach after she died, one to Auto Trader, and the remaining eight was just to random businesses or government agencies. Bobby Dassey said he saw Teresa Halbach pull up to the yard on October the 31st at around 2.50 p.m. And from that point, things are kind of unknown until 4.35 p.m. when Stephen Avery made a call to Teresa Halbach's cell phone without using the star 67 function. However, and this is very important to note, this call did not even show up on Teresa's phone records. So that means by 4.35 p.m., her phone had already been turned off or destroyed. When Stephen was asked why he made this call to Teresa, he said he was wanting her to come back and take a few more photos before she had driven too far away to turn around, which actually contradicts his own statement that Teresa left the salvage yard at around 2.30 p.m. So by his own account, she had left two hours before he called her phone at 4.35 p.m. Also, Earl and his brother-in-law, Robert, had seen Stephen unloading his snowmobile off of a trailer at around 5 p.m. that evening. They thought that was actually very strange. Earl even said that he thought something may be wrong with Stephen because he was acting peculiar. He was standing stiff as a board, just staring at the snowmobile and then just staring at the ground. He looked anxious and stressed and he wasn't relaxed at all. Earl said that Stephen was planning on selling or trading in the snowmobile. So Earl said it just didn't make any sense that he would be taking it off of the trailer and storing it in the garage because he would just have to reload it later back onto the trailer. Robert said that him and Earl did see smoke coming from the burn barrel in front of Stephen's trailer and it smelled like plastic that he was burning. The garage door was shut and Stephen's truck was parked in front of the garage blocking the view to the garage door. Robert said that he and Earl went over and tried to make some small talk with Stephen, but he was very quiet. It, he wasn't even laughing at the little jokes that his brother was throwing out there to him. He was just acting very awkward. Barb said three of her sons were all inside her home when she got home from work at 5 p.m. She went up to the hospital to see her boyfriend's mother, who was in the hospital, 
and she got back home at around 7 45 8 p.m and her boyfriend scott brought her back home at around 7 45 8 p.m she said that she did see there was a fire in the pit behind steven's trailer and she guesstimated that it was around three feet high however others stated that it looked much higher than that to them barb said that she did see that two people were standing by the fire but she couldn't really make out who they were but she also mentioned that her son brendan had been spending a lot of time recently with stephen brendan didn't really have many friends and he would help stephen with random things around his trailer but very interesting and important to note is that barb also said that on halloween brendan did help stephen clean out his garage and that Brendan's jeans had bleach stains on them when he got home from cleaning the garage with Stephen on Halloween. Another thing that's very telling is that Chuck, who is Stephen's brother, asked him at around 4.30 if the photographer had ever showed up from Auto Trader, and Stephen told him no, that she never showed up. Jody also called Stephen Halloween night at around 9 p.m. from the jail. Stephen told her, that him and Brendan had been doing some cleaning all evening, but he never mentioned the photographer being there. On November the 3rd, Stephen called Auto Trader and told them that the photographer never showed up to do the photo shoot on October the 31st. He also went on to tell them that Teresa had called him and told him that she would not be able to make it out there after all. Now, Teresa Hallbach's phone records show that she never called Stephen on October the 31st at any time. Ironically, though, on that same evening of November the 3rd at around 7 p.m., Stephen told Andy Colburn that Teresa was indeed there on October the 31st, and she had took photos of the van. Stephen said that he saw her from his window taking the photos, but he never talked to her and she was only there for like five or ten minutes. Now the book has the trial testimony of Colburn testifying to his interview with Stephen on November the 3rd. It's very detailed and interesting to say the very least. Now get this, on November the 4th, the very next day, four days after Teresa had disappeared, investigators from Calumet County went out and they spoke with Stephen. But this time, Stephen said that he had indeed talked to Teresa on October the 31st when she was there photographing the van and that she had even went into his trailer so he could pay her for the job. Now while Stephen, Brendan, and a few other family members were in their cabin up north after Teresa's murder had been determined, Stephen actually called into a live Nancy Grace show and he said how he was being framed again by Manitowoc County and this time it was for Teresa Hallbach's murder and that they were framing him out of revenge for the $36 million lawsuit. Nancy asked Stephen why he thought he was being framed and he said that the yard is rarely ever locked and people can come in and out anytime they want to. On November the 9th, Stephen was charged with felon in possession of a firearm and on November the 11th, the governor was set to appear in the Manitowoc courtroom to sign into law the new reform bill called Avery's Law. And of course, this ceremony was immediately called off. And when the law was put into effect, it was named the Criminal Justice Reforms Package. Chapter 16, Motive and Intent. In addition to direct evidence, investigators looked for opportunity and motive. Stephen absolutely had the opportunity to R and murder Teresa Halbach. He was the last person to make contact with her and the first person to deny seeing her. And then he later changed his story saying that he actually had spoken to her the day she disappeared. And motive and intent resides inside a person's mind. So the totality of the facts and circumstances around the case must be deeply observed. The big question is, why would someone so close to collecting millions of dollars from a wrongful conviction lawsuit, being considered a hero for so many and their families that have been and are currently wrongfully convicted, 
as well as have a whole new bill and law written into act bearing your name with a whole complete ceremony date with the governor of Wisconsin. Why would anyone do anything to ruin all of that by doing anything criminal to be sent back to prison? Most people, including the millions that watched the Making a Murderer series, had one very obvious answer to that question. They wouldn't. So looking back at Avery's past, it is very obvious that he held a lot of resentment and anger for being locked up for Penny Bernstein's attack for so long when he knew he was indeed innocent. It is obvious by just seeing the rude and vile letters and threats that he sent to his now ex-wife Lori while he was in prison, as well as his known sadistic sexual rages and fantasies of building a torture chamber for women upon his release. His prison records even indicated that he was and would continue to be a danger to society upon his release. In 1993, before he was exonerated and he was still in prison, his caseworker at the prison put some very concerning notes into his file. She also noted that Stephen was in serious need of help, but he refused to assist in his own rehabilitation. Her note is complete in the book, but in part it reads, Stephen Avery describes himself as a very impulsive person who acts out in anger. The caseworker said that Stephen has significant needs for anger management, domestic violence, and sexual behavior programming skills, as well as academic skills, all of which are available to him at the prison, but he refused all of the help. Now, when you take all of that into consideration, and knowing that he had called Teresa Halbach to his trailer to take the pictures of the Grand Prix just a few weeks before he lured her back out there on Halloween to take photos of Barb's van that was not even for sale. And knowing that he had a photo that was taken of his erect personal part on the same day that she came on October the 10th, to take the Grand Prix photos. Also the fact that beside that photo was Teresa Halbach's phone number and a note that only read back to the patio door. And there was also the fact that he had bought the hand and ankle cuffs on October the 9th, the day before that he asked Teresa to come to his trailer. It is also known that Jody had been incarcerated for just under two months at that time and she has said that Stephen had to have sex every day, and most of the time it was more like four to five times a day. But she had not been there for almost two months, and Jody was not going to be released for several many more months, and Stephen knew this. So who did Stephen buy those hand and ankle cuffs for on October the 9th? We know that he did invite his nephew's underage girlfriend to come over to his trailer the night of October the 9th to quote, have some fun and make the bed bang against the wall real hard, end quote, which of course creeped her out and she hung up on him. Then there is the fact that the very next morning he called Auto Trader Magazine asking for Teresa Hallbox specifically to come out that day. He gave a false name and his sister's number where he knew that no one was going to be at home, as well as the vehicle to be photographed was not even his, nor was it for sale. He also used the star 67 function to hide his own number. And what's even stranger about all of that is why did he not call Teresa Halbach's personal cell? He knew her number. He had called it on October the 10th to have her come to take the pictures of the Grand Prix. So calling Auto Trader office to request her specifically really made no sense. He even had her personal cell number on his computer desk beside his private part photo. Now was it because he knew that Teresa would not come out there if she knew it was him? Now honestly, after knowing all of these facts, it is a strong possibility, let's be honest, that Stephen planned all of this out to lure Teresa out to his trailer and she would not know she was actually going to be meeting with him 
and not be Jonda at all, to act out some built-up perverse satisfactions with physical violence and sexual aggression that he had built up over the course of Jody's incarceration. And if the entire Manitowoc system planted everything and framed Stephen to take the fall for a murder that he did not commit, then who did the defense assume killed Teresa? They made it known many times that they were not accusing or alleging that anyone in the sheriff's office was responsible for her murder at all, only that they were the ones that was responsible for planning all of the evidence to frame Stephen. So with all of that said, who does the defense believe did murder Teresa Halbach? Also, how would the defense not be the least bit worried that at some point the real killer may open up and tell someone that they're the ones that murdered Teresa, or that as any other evidence will be tested for DNA in the future, that the real killer's DNA will not be found in the RAV4. After all, that is how Stephen Avery was exonerated in Penny's case. And there's also the fact that all of these sheriff's office staffs that were allegedly involved in planning all of these evidence were putting their careers on the line as well as the reputations and livelihoods of their own families. If it was ever proved that they were indeed planning evidence and framing an innocent man just to help the former employees of the sheriff's department get revenge on Avery, not to even mention they would lose their retirements and everything that they had ever worked for and possibly even land some serious criminal charges and go to prison themselves. So let's be totally honest here for just a moment, folks. That would honestly make no sense for the whole sheriff's office to do just to protect the ones responsible for Avery's wrongful conviction two decades ago. And there was only one left at the office that was even involved in the wrongful conviction case anyway. The others had already retired or moved away. As far as the lawsuit money that was to be paid out to Avery, why would they care if he collected his settlement? It would not change the amounts of their checks every week, nor would it change their lives, really, not in the least bit. So make it make sense. For the Sheriff's Department staff to be honestly involved in planning evidence everywhere and framing Stephen, these people all had everything to lose and absolutely nothing to gain. So honestly, if you really think about it, why would they? How would they? The Avery property had numerous family members that lived on the property, as well as they had a very, very alert property dog named Bear. This dog barked very loudly at any stranger that came onto the property. Bear actually held back the first search efforts of the burn pit for a while by barking and standing guard over the pit. Also, the fact that several members of the family worked from daylight to dark on the property and around the salvage yard. So how could anything really have been planted and literally no one seen anything at all or anyone at all out of the ordinary on the property? Does it really seem likely that dozens of employees with the sheriff's office would all form this union to plant everything while being monitored by officers from another county, as well as during their searches. Planting bone fragments, teeth, the RAV4, the license plate from the RAV4 that was found in a totally different vehicle that, ironically, was very close to Stephen's trailer. And it was a very lengthy distance from the RAV4. It was the blood, the DNA on the hood latch, the key, the bullets, one with Teresa Halbach's DNA on it that was proven and confirmed was fired from Stephen Avery's shotgun that was hanging above his bed and Teresa Halbach's personal items that were in the burn barrel in front of Stephen's trailer. How would the cops even have known that Stephen was going to have a big bonfire behind his trailer on Halloween night and just thought to themselves that that would be such an excellent place to sneak into and throw her broken and charred remains into the ashes of a burn pit. Who would ever believe all of the expert witnesses at the trial, all of the crime lab analysts, 
all of the cops, the FBI, etc., etc., were all in on this cover-up to frame Stephen Avery, and they were all working together, risking all of their careers, their license, retirements, livelihoods, everything and possibly even going to prison for a very long time themselves, just to get even with Stephen Avery? Now make that make sense. And what about the actual killer? Seeing as the defense did not believe that anyone in the sheriff's office was responsible for Teresa's murder, but they were all responsible as a unit for planning everything to frame Stephen. So what gives? Who killed her then? Was it just some random person out there that was sitting back and watching Stephen go to prison for life for something he didn't do? If Stephen and Brendan Dassey did indeed murder Teresa Halbach in the way that Brendan said they did, then why wasn't there any evidence at all inside the trailer? Dassey said that Stephen had her on the bed, he stabbed her in the stomach, and Brendan said he cut her throat, and they both cut off her hair. So why wasn't there one sign of any blood or hair or anything else in Stephen's trailer? Now, if what Brendan says is true, that all of these things did happen inside the trailer, then Stephen may have had plastic possibly covering the bed as well as even the floor of the bedroom. If Stephen did indeed plan out luring Teresa to his trailer with obvious intentions of aring and killing her, he would have done some preventive maintenance knowing that DNA is extremely important and very hardcore. It's undeniable evidence. And Stephen, of all people, absolutely knew that. There was no blood spatter on the walls, though. Well, a stab in the stomach would not necessarily merit blood spatter, as well as cutting a throat. Neither would cause blood splatter unless they were done very hard and fast which possibly they were not. Torture is usually done slowly, and Stephen Avery indeed had an obsession of wanting to torture women. Also the fact that his brother seen him at the burn barrel burning something that smelled like plastic. Brendan did tell his mother that he didn't do everything. He did do some of the things he said in his interrogation. We know this because we heard it in the recorded jail calls when he was talking to his mother. Also, Stephen and Brendan would have had until November the 5th, when the RAV4 was found and the search warrants started being served to clean up everything and try to get rid of all the evidence of anything happening. And five days can clean and hide a lot, especially seeing as Brendan's mother even said that he had been helping Stephen clean for long hours and came home Halloween night with bleach all over his jeans as well as Stephen's brother saying that Brendan was moving burnt tires and wires from the burn pit, and the rake by the pit had bone fragments in the teeth. When Stephen's trailer was first searched, the officer said the trailer was extremely clean, basically spotless. There was containers of bleach on the counter as well. Stephen Avery's girlfriend Jody also said that her and Stephen were both clean freaks, and Stephen's brothers even said when he was arrested, they said they lost the best janitor that they ever had. He was obsessed with cleaning, and he could not stand anything to really get too dirty. He was even always cleaning things when he was in prison. So, when Stephen's attorney said that Stephen may be many things, but he is not a good housekeeper, that comment actually made many people that actually knew Stephen drop their mouths open in surprise, as that was far from the truth. Something else that was very interesting is that Stephen had moved the furniture in the bedroom after Teresa was murdered. Stephen's girlfriend Jody was shown a diagram of where the furniture was in the bedroom upon the first entrance into the trailer by officers. Jody was asked if this is the way the bedroom was set up when she went to jail in August of 2005. Her testimony at trial is all put into the book of her being questioned on the layout of her bedroom and how it was changed from the diagram and the photos she was shown in trial. But when Jody looked at the diagram, she said no. It was not like that at the time she went to jail. She said when she went to jail that the bed was in a different place altogether. Jody described where the bed had been when she went to jail, and what is even more telling, 
that Jody's testimony is proof that Stephen Avery had moved the furniture in the room around after Teresa's murder was that Jody's description of exactly where the bed was and the headboard was matched exactly to the sketch that Brendan Dassey had drawn for police on March the 1st, 2006. Brendan's sketch was also entered into evidence as Exhibit 208. Chapter 17, Colburn and Link. This chapter actually starts out by talking about the alternate suspects that the viewers of Making a Murder had theorized up. First on the list was Teresa's ex-boyfriend, Ryan. Also, her roommate, Scott. And the reason so many were so quick to believe that Ryan was the actual one to kill Teresa is because he was so invested in the original search efforts. Also, there was Brendan's brother, Bobby, and stepfather, Scott. At one point, even Brendan's mother, Barb, was on the suspicious list, saying that she was covering for Bobby and Scott. Now, even till today, there is still a lot of talk about Bobby, a lot, including from Stephen's newest attorney, Kathleen Zellner. Now, you will see here on the screen Bobby Dassey, with Stephen's then attorney. You see, there was many shady things about Bobby. He actually said he did see Teresa Halbach going up to Stephen's trailer that day, and he had went hunting and all things of that nature. And I'm not even going to get into it because it's even not in the book. This is not in the book either. This is my own personal saying here. Bobby, the things that were found on his computer when their home was searched, and I hear that the computer was shared by him as well as Brendan. I do not know, but we do know that it was Bobby's computer. The things that were found on his computer was disgusting. I'm not even sure why he wasn't arrested for some of the images that was said that was found on his computer. And yes, we're talking about children. So, I mean, I'm just throwing that out there. Definitely not anyone I would want around Anybody I know, just to be quite honest, but let's get on into this. And then we have Stephen's ex-girlfriend, Jody. Jody went through hell on social media. People saying that she was only out just to make money from the interviews that she was doing, telling her side of the story and how she was abused by Stephen. They came at her with spears for betraying Stephen on these interviews. Stephen wrote a letter even saying, quote, she was just a backstabbing alcoholic, end quote. But what viewers of Making a Murder did not realize or most likely did not even take the time to Google is that everything Jody said could easily be confirmed by public records and police reports that had been made available long before Making a Murder was ever made. They're still out there. This was also way before Stephen Avery was known to the whole world as being a poor innocent soul being framed again by a crooked town. And then there was even Stephen's young niece. She was underage and yes, again, the records also show the reports that clearly state how Stephen took full advantage of his niece and then threaten her if she talked. And yes, again, these reports were also made and filed before making a murder. And this girl is honestly the most upsetting of them all to me. She sees hordes of people defending the man that forever put lasting scars on her heart and memories and took her innocence. And he's being glorified and defended to the ends of the earth while she sits there with her painful memories of what she knows for a fact that he is capable of. These people defend him against her. And the way they were doing it at one point was so bad, there was even the comment that she did see that said, quote, where I am from, a 17-year-old niece would not be illegal anyway, end quote. And just to say that is disgusting, and that's a huge understatement. And of course... Colburn and Link, who so many absolutely believe, planted the evidence that framed Stephen. But as the author does point out in the book, why wouldn't they believe 
that they were framed and the evidence planted, especially with the way that the documentary cut and spliced these guys' testimonies to make it appear that they were very nervous and they were even avoiding answering questions. Making a murder did make these two look like absolute evil villains. I'm not going to disagree. And embarrassingly enough, I have to admit that I fully fell for it myself watching the documentary. Now, the author actually went into the background of both Colburn and Link. Neither has ever had any sort of complaint at all. Quite the opposite, actually. Both of their backgrounds are all but upstanding citizens. Colburn is even an Air Force vet and was awarded upstanding awards from the military. The author goes into depth explanation into all of that. But just summing up very, very little about what the author told about these guys is they do not have the past or even the future after the Avery trial to have been the sneaky crooked cops they were made out to be at all. Chapter 18, The Confession The hardest evidence against Stephen Avery in the beginning was, of course, the overly detailed press conference that Kratz gave on March the 2nd of 2006. The details of Brendan's confession that Kratz put out to the public world were shocking and extremely incriminating. If you have never heard this press conference, it is all written in the book as well as easily obtained on YouTube. There is really no way anyone could ever hear these details and not automatically have prejudice against Stephen and Brenton, potentially poisoning the jury. However, evidence do not lie, as well as the saying, the best way to judge the future is by the past. This saying does not always ring true, but when there is repeat patterns that only seem to get worse as time goes by, you do have to put consideration into past events if they remotely coincide with the situation at hand, especially when physical evidence back up these circumstances. A confession is basically not much more than a statement. However, the jury most of the time puts very much emphasis into confessions, when many times we know very well that confessions can be coerced, especially when an interrogation technique called the read is used, which is exactly what was used to get the confession out of Brendan, and what the general public and oftentimes the jury believes is why would anyone ever confess to a murder if they did not actually commit the murder? Because obviously confessing to murder will in most cases put you in prison for the rest of your life. But the hard, cold reality is you would be very shocked to know that false confessions happen way more often than you would ever like to believe. And that is just a solid fact. See, Brendan's confession was not admissible in Stephen's trial because a deal had not been made yet. Brendan could not be called to the stand in Stephen's trial. So anything that Brendan had confessed to at this point was nothing more than hearsay. So of course the jury was told in the very beginning that Brendan's confession, all most likely had heard from the press conference, did not hold any bearing whatsoever on Stephen's trial, and they were told to put his confession entirely out of their minds when forming their decisions on the Avery trial. In Brendan's interrogation, making a murder showed only the parts where there was a very vulnerable and mentally challenged, scared, and nervous 16-year-old. He was biting his nails occasionally, rarely even lifting his head, and giving very short answers. And as you see, two very seasoned detectives are pressuring this scared kid that has no attorney with him and not even a parent, drilling him with very leading questions about the victim's head. What happened to her head? And after Brendan answers these questions with saying just random things that could happen to someone's head, like cutting their hair, punching them in the face, and he even said he cut her throat himself. Of course, the detectives knew none of these details, and it may be possible that those were things that Brendan was just making up, some of them at least, so they would stop drilling him 
and have an answer. The detectives were trying to find out who shot Teresa in the head because they knew at that point that she had been shot in the head because the testing of the skull fragment, there were traces of metal that was found on the shell that was used when she was shot. So the detectives finally just came out and said who shot her and Brendan immediately and even without any sort of emotion, remorse, or shock at all, he said he did. Leading questions are not allowed in court for a damn good reason. They lead to an answer that they obviously want to hear. See, being true and being reliable is two totally different things. If the defendant was coerced into a confession and then the law says it cannot be used at all in the trial because of the reliability of the coerced confession and no one should ever be put in prison due to unreliable evidence. The confession may be 100% truth, but then again, it may not be. The judge will actually analyze many aspects of the confession before they will allow it to be admissible in court. And coercion and leading questions during interrogation is a big, fat, hell no admissible by law. Basically, there are two types of interrogation that the judge uses to decide if the confession is admissible or not. And those are an involuntary confession, which is not admissible, and of course, the voluntary confession, which is admissible. And in Brendan's case, the judge did rule that the confession was voluntary. And of course, Brendan's attorney appealed the judge's ruling there. The Court of Appeals took a look at it as well, and they also ruled that it was voluntary and they did rule it admissible. So after his sentencing, Dassey took it to the federal court and they too looked it over and decided that it was a voluntary confession and that appeal was also shot down. So that's way more than just the Manitowoc County deciding that it was a voluntary confession and could be admissible for trial. And from what they were shown on making a murder, his confession was absolutely untrue and should have never been admissible. However, the detectives did stay within their guidelines when questioning Brendan. They never threatened him. They never rose their voices at him. They offered him breaks, snacks, drinks, anything to keep him comfortable. There was no up in his face screaming, no physical movements on behalf of the detectives, all of these sort of tactics were done largely in the past, but they're rarely ever used anymore. In today's age, the read technique is used on the right suspects. It is used easily for the detectives for the young, the lower educated level, and easily manipulated people. This technique usually makes it pretty easy to get a confession. But the fall down with this technique is it does account for many, many false confessions. And in some cases, the detective may just be trying to get some sort of confession out of the suspect, more so than even trying to get the truth out of the suspect. Believe me, it does happen. Now, the read technique is played out in steps. The ending is trying to get the suspect to confess by saying they already know exactly what happened. They will throw little things that they have, text, cell records, surveillance, a friend has told them everything, etc., etc. This is until the suspect is feeling like they are going to be charged no matter if they are innocent or not. Usually, the suspect will hear the detective go into the step of offering them an out and telling them they know it wasn't their fault, they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time, those kinds of things. They will even use the tactic trying to make them feel like they could be the hero of this crime because they were actually trying to intervene to help what was happening. And things kind of just got out of hand. All of these steps are used in this very well put together read technique and it works more often than not. But it also, as I have already said, does account for many false confessions because the suspect just makes things up just to pacify the detective that is being so nice and almost feels like they want to be friends with the suspect. The thing with Brendan's confession that making a murderer showed 
it appeared in the documentary that Brendan really didn't know anything about what happened to Teresa Halbach. Like, why couldn't he remember if Stephen Avery shot her in the head? And I mean, let's be honest. If you were there taking part in a horrific crime like that, and a person is shot at almost point-blank range in the head multiple times with a shotgun, that is not something that you're just going to forget easily, right? I mean, the way it was shown on Making a Murder is Brendan was just saying things that they wanted to hear, right? And then the detectives just threw at him who shot her. It almost appeared that the police targeted Brendan to use as an easy way to get a confession and be able to build a stronger case against Stephen. But in reality, when Brendan gave this confession, as you can see for yourself in the public records, there was already plenty of solid evidence against Stephen as well as he had already been incarcerated four months at that time and was on a very large cash bond. Not only was the confession tape that was shown on making a murder a very small part of the entire interrogation, it was also cut and spliced footages of the actual interrogation. Also, were you aware that Netflix and the producers of Making a Murder are being sued at this current time for defamation on this documentary? It's a fact. But this interrogation was not the first time that they had talked to Brendan at all. It was actually the fourth time. And contrary to very popular beliefs about him being a minor and being interrogated without a parent or attorney going against his rights, well, that's not so either. His mother was there, and she was asked if she would like to sit in with him. She declined to sit in with him, and she even signed and gave her full consent for him to be interrogated without a parent or attorney present. She actually done the same thing on all four occasions that he was questioned. So honestly, that whole theory can seriously be put to rest. And please feel free to look at the record yourself and say that this is absolutely the truth. Brendan never spoke to anyone without his mother's full written consent as well, as she was always offered the opportunity to sit in with him during each and every time he was questioned. You see, Brendan was first talked to in November of 2005, shortly after Teresa Halbach's murder. And he did give them some details, but nothing that made it appear that he was involved in any sort of way. It was actually later that Brendan was ever considered a suspect at all. And the reason he did eventually become one was because of a comment that Kayla Avery had made when she was giving a statement about what she had observed between Stephen Avery and Jody, which, by the way, lined up accurately to a statement that Jody had given them about an incident where Stephen was being abusive to her. But Kayla said her cousin Brendan had taken all of this very hard. Now, the author has the exact words she gave in her statement. Mine, of course, is verbatim, and that Brendan had been sort of acting up. They asked her what she meant by that, and she said that he was taking it all so hard, that he had already lost like 40 pounds in just the last couple of months since it all happened. And he would just sit there and stare into space and just burst out crying for no reason. Her and her mother, Candy Avery, also said they both had seen the fire Halloween night at Stevens when him and Brendan were having the bonfire. A week after they talked to Kayla, they wanted to speak with Brendan, and they knew very quickly into their interview with him that he knew something about Teresa Halbach's murder. Ultimately, Brendan had told them about Teresa Halbach's body in the fire. He told them that Stephen Avery had threatened him to keep his mouth shut. Brendan said that Stephen Avery had stabbed Teresa Halbach in a RAV4, and he hid the vehicle under some branches, and he was going to crush it later on. Brendan did have leading questions to get these details. However, 
His details were only things that someone there could have known. They did ask Brendan, was there any point that Stephen Avery may have injured himself while doing all of this? And Brendan openly said that Stephen had a cut on his finger. He had cut it on some glass close to the garage, but later on, Brendan said Stephen also cut his finger with a knife while he was stabbing Teresa Halbach. During the interview, it was apparent that the investigators realized that the questions they were asking Brendan were leading, and they knew that they needed to get more voluntary answers from him in order for this confession to even be admissible. So they released Brendan so he could attend his final class of that day at school and after speaking with the investigators for close to two hours. Brenda's mother was called to come to the school and she was informed of everything and she agreed to bring Brendan to the police department so he could be videotaped and questioned there. After school, and they all arrived at the police department. Barb was asked to sit in with Brendan while he was being questioned, to which she declined to do. She signed the consent for him to be questioned. Brendan was taken to the interview room at the police department, and his second interview began. First, he was read his Miranda rights, and then the questioning began. Brendan's demeanor was different than what it had been at school. He seemed more relaxed and he talked more freely and in sentences rather than just mumbling a few words. Saying that he got home from school at around 4.45 on Halloween and at around 8 p.m. his uncle Stephen asked if he wanted to come over to his house for a bonfire. Brendan said that he did see Teresa's RAV4 when he got home from school. He said that Stephen noticed that he seen Teresa's body in the bonfire underneath some tires and branches. He said Stephen actually noticed him looking at the body parts and Stephen told him that he would have to stab him too if he told anyone about seeing it. Now this time Brendan told them that Stephen had told him that Teresa Hallbach's fingernails is what cut his hand while he was stabbing her and she was trying to stop him. Okay, then on Brendan's third interrogation on March the 1st, it was obvious that everything Brendan had answered for the investigators were answered by them leading him in questions. Brendan's story changed again in this interview. This time, he said that he had played a role in the murder and that he had essayed Teresa also. Brendan went on to say that Stephen stabbed Teresa and told him to slit her throat. Then Stephen stabbed her in the garage. He said they backed Teresa's RAV4 into the garage and put her body in the back of her RAV4, saying Stephen's original plan was to put her body in the pond, but the pond was not deep enough, so that plan just didn't pan out as Stephen had planned for it to do. Now, even though it is hard to actually believe Brendan's confession because he changed his story so many times because of the investigators' leading questions, it was very obvious that some of the new details that he told were true because they lined up perfectly with the physical evidence, such as before Brendan told them she was shot in the garage, they had no clue where she had been shot. They just knew that she had indeed been shot in the head. Brenton told them she was actually shot twice in the head, which police did not even know that yet. So this was new details that did eventually line up as well as truth. When Brendan told them where she was shot, an immediate search was ordered at that very moment for the garage. The search was distinctively to look for blood and shells. And there were indeed two shells found, one with Teresa Hallbach's DNA on it. They knew she had been shot in the head due to receiving a call on February the 28th from the Wisconsin Crime Lab. They were told that the charred remains of the skull had what was believed to be an entrance from a gunshot and there was traces of lead left behind on the skull from the shell. Now, on Making a Murder, the clip 
that showed Job was cut and spliced. The part where Brendan told them what kind of gun Stephen used to shoot her or how many times she was shot. After the full examination of her remains and the partial fragments of her skull, there was indeed two different shots fired at close range into Teresa's skull. There is no way the detectives could have told him to say she was shot in the head two times without them knowing that themselves, and they didn't, not at this point. These were new details, and this was not anything that Brendan had been led into saying in any way. They were completely voluntary statements. The blood patterns in the back of the RAV4 were spot on consistent with Teresa being in the back of the vehicle with blood in her hair. And also, the voluntary and new details were that Stephen had opened the hood of the RAV4. Brendan said he didn't know why he opened it though, but it is now known that he opened it to undo the battery cables to disable any sort of devices that may possibly be on the vehicle. Then the RAV4's hood and underneath the hood was swapped for any possible DNA that could confirm Brendan's statement. And there it was, Stephen Avery's DNA on the hood latch. So it was clear that even though much of Brendan's statements did come from the leading questions from the investigators using the read technique on him, it was the voluntary statements that even they had no idea about that Brendan told them, which of course were all proven to be voluntary truths by evidence backing them. Now if police hadn't have spoken to Kayla and she gave them the information that Brendan had been with Stephen Avery at the burn pit on Halloween night and the information of which sounded as though Brendan had something on his mind that was really eating him alive inside. With his major weight loss and his sudden outburst of pain and crying after seeing... Now going into questioning Brendan, the detectives only thought of Brendan as a potential suspect. Brendan would have never even been spoke to at all had Kayla not mentioned Brendan's actions since the murder. He turned from suspect to potential accomplice when he told them what he seen was Teresa's body parts in that fire. Then Kayla would most likely have never even had a follow-up interview had her school counselor not contacted the police department. You see, Brendan was at a birthday party with his cousin Kayla in December of 2005, which is close to two months after Teresa's murder. And Brendan told her that he had seen Teresa Halbach pinned up in Stephen's trailer, and he had seen her body in the burn pit. And after he confessed this to Kayla, he got very anxious and visibly upset. She said he looked extremely shook up. The way Brendan kept acting and what he told her at this birthday party bothered her so long and so bad that she had to tell someone when she went back to school after Christmas break. So in January of 2006, when school resumed, a teacher's aide that was in the counselor's office when Kayla told her about this also testified in court to what she seen and heard. The testimony is all in the book, the complete testimony, but in short, the aide's testimony was that she was that she said Kayla went into the counselor's office at school and she was in there as well and the counselor asked Kayla if she wanted her to leave before they talked and Kayla said no, that was fine, she could stay. So the aide stayed in the room. Kayla told the counselor that she was scared. And when the counselor asked her why, she said because her cousin had told her that he seen her uncle Stephen had asked Brendan to help him move a body. And Kayla specifically asked the counselor if blood could come up through concrete. Now the aide went on to say that Kayla talked with the counselor for about 15 or 20 minutes. And when she left the office, she still seemed scared but maybe the counselor talking to her maybe made her feel a little bit better. 
Now with this information, they felt like a follow-up visit with Kayla was needed. So detectives did sit down again with Kayla and her mother on March the 7th at their home. Kayla told them some of the things that Stephen does to her. She told them about things like grabbing her, pulling her into him, kissing her, and telling her she had big boobies. Investigators then asked her about some of the things that she told the school counselor. Initially, she told them she couldn't remember, but then she finally opened up and she broke down and she started crying. She eventually did admit that Brendan told her that he took Stephen his mail that day when he got off the bus and he saw Teresa pinned up in his trailer. Then later on, when he went back, he saw her body parts in Stephen's fire. Kayla said that Brendan told her not to tell anybody because Stephen told him that if he told anyone that the same thing was going to happen to him. He said Brendan told her the last thing that he heard when he left Stephen's trailer after bringing him his mail was Teresa Hallbach screaming. Kayla made a written statement out for the investigators of what she had just told them, which is all in the book, but added to her written statement aside from what she verbally told investigators, she also added, I really do think Brendan done something also because he was forced. I hate Stephen a lot and I hope he rots in hell. Ironically, in the trial, and when she was facing Brendan, she said she made everything up. And Brendan really didn't tell her any of that. When she was asked why she lied to police, she said that she was confused. And when she was asked what she was confused about, she replied, I don't know, everything. But in a recorded jail conversation with his mother, when he was totally alone, and there was no way of any coercion or leading whatsoever by anyone, Brendan did tell his mother that he was indeed with Stephen and helped him with the murder of Teresa Halbach. His mother asked him if he did it, and he said, yeah, but not all of it. His mother told him to tell the truth about everything. Brendan told her that the investigators told him he might only get 20 years if he told the truth, but he also said that he could not take that deal because he could not have to face Stephen in court to tell the truth. And this recorded call is also public record and can be heard online. Chapter 19, Parting Thoughts. In this closing chapter, the author talks about his journey when he became obsessed with Avery's case in 2003, when he was working on helping this wrongfully convicted man be exonerated. He talks about how it is unfortunate that making a murder did not put more focus on the wrongful conviction case instead of buddying up with Avery's new dream team of attorneys to prove that he was framed again by the crooked cops in Manitowoc County. He talks about how the system does get it wrong so many times, and it definitely needs some reform in ways of investigations and trials and such are handled to stop the wrongful convictions of innocent people and allowing the actual criminals to remain free. All to save money and close a case as fast as possible and sometimes this is done using raid technique and false confessions as well. He talks about how the majority of the people will sit down and watch a documentary before they would pull court records and trial transcripts and discoveries and have to read all of that themselves. They would just assume that due to legal reasons that the documentaries cannot legally cut, edit, splice interviews and actual court and trial proceedings to make them appear a certain way and to fit the narrative that will suck people into their series to keep watching. So people will take what they can take away from most documentaries as what they just seen is absolutely what happened and the way it happened. I mean, how could they or would they want to manipulate their own viewers? Well, this case proved that was exactly what was done in making a murderer. 
everything is out there and readily available online to anybody that wants to see the actual truth and watch or listen and read the interviews and things themselves. Also, the media tends to always sway towards the prosecution side in almost every high profile case with their reporting. So using news clips and making a murder also added to the smoke and mirrors that everyone was out to take Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey down this time for good. And what were they going to do? The family are all undereducated as well as a type of loners and staying together kind of hillbilly outcast, if you will, which also pulls viewers minds towards a sympathetic decision and anything that can add proof to the way they are seeing things just adds more and more proof to the narrative that Stephen is being framed again. And this time, they even had to manipulate his 16-year-old nephew, Brendan, into saying anything that they could use against them both. And they were able to do just that. But the reality is, the timeline and the evidence and the interviews and confessions does not line up at all with the documentary's narrative. Because the documentary only showed their narrative, even if it meant that they had to manipulate footage and records to show viewers their narrative. For example, that file was debunked absolutely. Even the defense never even tried to go with that theory again. So why did the producers even feel the need to add that very dramatic finding of the vial into the series? Because it added to the drama and suspense and narrative of a frame-up. That is why. The author talks also about how these sort of manipulative stories and documentaries have been around for decades. But with it now being common also in the news and legal documents, that is not anything that needs to be being done. It can and does create huge problems and even danger for the targeted ones they show in these documentaries. Also, in this closing chapter, he brings up the lady from earlier that thought her husband may be involved in Teresa Hallwalk's murder. Now, as you know, I did skip a couple of chapters that was fully about this lady and her husband. And this is why. She moved back in with her husband, and at the writing of this book, which was in 2017, is when it was published. It is said that they moved to another state, and she no longer believes her husband had anything to do with Teresa Halbach's murder whatsoever. He also confirmed that the statement that he made and sent out regarding the wife's statement about her husband possibly being involved, it was indeed forwarded onto Kratz as well as Avery's attorneys, Booting and Strang, and none of them ever mentioned it. So obviously, even Avery's attorneys did not believe her husband was involved either. He then goes into thanking everyone that helped him to get the book written and put together. 23 pages of evidence and trial photos with explanations underneath each photo in the book. And of course, the author also has a brief but very interesting biography of himself. As I say, the book was published in 2017 and it is available to purchase on Amazon. And as always, I will leave a link to the book in the description box below. I want to thank you all so much for listening to this synopsis, and please let me know in the comments, what do you think? Do you think Stephen Avery is guilty, innocent? Did this book synopsis open your mind up in any sort of way to things that you weren't aware of after watching the documentary? Because I can say it sure did mine. It also put me in to digging up the actual trial transcripts and watching the interviews myself because I am one that will fact check and I did. Needless to say, I do believe Stephen Avery is guilty and I also believe Brendan Dassey is guilty. And Brendan being a 16 year old kid with even a lower mentality rate than 16, I believe Brendan should be home now. I do believe that he spent enough time and I do not believe Brendan is 
any sort of rest to anyone. Yes, I do believe that Stephen is right where he needs to be, and I think he needs to be there for the rest of his life. But I do believe Brenda needs to be brought home. Thank you all so much for listening, and until next time, this is Unjustified.